All right, well, here we are once again. Another week has gone by. It's time for episode three of the podcast. Doom drop, here we go. Shun, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling pretty good, Sian, actually. How are you? I'm doing all right, man. I'm sitting here in my apartment in Japan, chilling. Uh, my wife is in Osaka doing a yoga conference. So, um, yeah, nice. I've got a place to myself. Been doing a lot of streaming lately, a lot of practicing. You know, I feel like... I played StarCraft for my whole life, but I never actually played until uh, the past like two months, I think, when I started streaming and like actually uh, studying the game and really like learning how to how to execute. Interesting. So you feel like you're actually finally fully engaged with the game at the moment? Yeah, I feel like what I've been doing for years is just kind of peripherally, you know, playing here and there and and watching and you know studying strategy um by just watching pro players but not actually looking at what they were doing specifically and why they were doing it just kind mm. of you know observing just observing and now i'm really like um integrating it into myself do you know what i mean yeah, kind of absorbing the idiosyncrasies of those players and kind of trying to internalize exactly what's going on the screen rather than just kind of, you know, seeing it as like a normal spectator. Kind of like when you analyze like a rap song or something, you can listen to it, just enjoy the beat and the vibe of the lyrics. Or you can actually like really start to pick apart the double entendres and listen to the bars really carefully and see what they're actually trying to say. Yeah, I'm I'm now kind of looking at players as though I was them in in the position that they were in. You know what I mean? Rather than just watching it as like a fan and an observer, I'm like thinking of myself exactly. in that game and like, you know, how do I get out of the situation? How do I, uh, you know, respond to the situation? Yeah. So I feel like I'm actually mm. playing, I'm playing the game of StarCraft finally. And so people keep asking me like, how long have you been playing StarCraft? I get that comment so much in my stream and I don't know. I, I I feel like I've only been playing for like two months, but <laughs> I have to say like I've been playing <laughs> for 20 years, you know? Well, in a psychological sense, it sounds like you're finally developing the cognitive empathy, but within the StarCraft sphere. Mm, you know, I'm sort of uh, placing myself in the game when I'm actually watching these days rather than just right. having fun and, you know, enjoying the... I mean, I'm still enjoying the experience of watching, but maybe I'm even enjoying it more because I'm like getting more out of it. No, I know exactly what you mean. I, I kind of get that vibe when I watch StarCraft games where, or the same as I listen to rap music, like I just said, like I can, I feel like I can get more out of it than I would if I was looking at it more on a surface level. We're getting some like uh, electric sounding feedback from your microphone. Can you say a little bit more about that? About what, sorry? Um, just, we'll cut this part out. Can you keep talking? Ask me about the electrical feedback. So, well, what kind of electrical feedback are you getting here? It might have been the buzz of my vape as I put it to my lips. That's very possible. Yeah, it might have been like the elect electric signal from your vape or something like that, kind of like crossing into your microphone. I'm not sure. Well, every everything electronic kind of pro does produce some degree of like electromagnetic field. Interestingly enough, you know what I mean. All right, I think it's. I think it might be gone now. Yeah, it's probably your vape. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was the vape. That's very interesting. Hmm. And I was watching a film recently, um, Small Soldiers, actually, and it's kind of an interesting film. Uh, it's kind of also what I wanted to initially talk about today, mm. artificial intelligence. And um, in that film, basically, the whole concept of the way to deal with the threat was you needed some kind of EMP, electromagnetic pulse. But one of the guys in the film says about how, like, you know, all elect electronic devices do, you know, create some degree of like magnetic field and stuff. So it's interesting you, you, the debate thing happened. You wanted to talk about small soldiers. Isn't that the movie about uh, toys becoming alive? Yes. So basically, it's basically a toy company that gets bought out. And this big, you know, CEO comes in and he's fired all the board and everything. So there's two nerds like in the room, like, where's everyone? And he's like, oh, no, you're the only two that are left, you know, and you've, you're going to make these toys into actual fun toys that can actually do the things in the commercials. And so they, they, they've got three months to kind of figure that out. And what they do is they, because their company is also 
uh, an umbrella company which is attached to a defense department they have access to all kinds of crazy stuff so they're using their new because because of the fact that they, the ceo has just come in he's just given them like security clearance to go and get access to all this stuff so they go on the database to look, and look up these like uh, military chips and he finds these x1000 military chips which are usually used in the guidance systems basically to make sure munitions are reaching their target with pinpoint accuracy however we're not used because they lacked the uh, shielding or rather it'd be too cost inefficient to provide shielding to the chips to prevent the EMPs becoming an issue because when a nuclear weapon goes off it releases a big electromagnetic pulse and that would knock out all the chips which is kind of useless for the military so these chips are like really super advanced but they don't have any kind of way of dealing with um, electromagnetic pulse so they were kind of like discontinued so they're in surplus and like you know readily available to be used so they get they order a bunch of these chips to basically just like plug into these tiny little toys and what they don't realize is these these aren't just your average chips these are like um microprocessors that are designed to like kind of self-learn and so you can give them a primary objective of say eliminate the gorgonites but they're not only really going to know how to eliminate the Gorgonites. They're going to learn how to do that in the most efficient way possible while also learning about the world and also kind of developing some sense of sentient intelligence while they're going about that. Uh, this is one of my favorite movies as a kid. I loved this movie. Me too. It was, was so fun. Um, but it is maybe one of the earliest AI movies, right? Like this is... Right. It was ahead of its time. Yeah. It was um, <laughs> one of those movies that uh took a step outside the box and really hit it hit hit like a nerve i'm surprised they didn't make like a, a follow-up and a bunch of crappy sequels and stuff but like that yeah. was very popular at the time and um ai was not even a generally discussed thing i think if something like that not came out all. today like it would be a lot more successful because it's just such it's so in this the the public consciousness now ai everyone's talking about it, everyone's thinking oh, absolutely. about absolutely it's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it on the podcast. It was to me, it felt a little bit on the nose, like everyone's talking about AI. But at the same time, it was almost like, well, okay, well, maybe we should talk about it at least a little bit. So I wanted to dedicate a segment to AI for this purposes. And yeah, the film, watching it recently through my new, you know, adult lens, so to speak, rather than looking at it through the lens of a kid that was just fascinated with the more like action elements of the film or not. I know there's so many crazy things about the film. Like for example, in Alan's room, the main character, the boy. At his computer, there's a big black sign that says "Question Reality." Hmm. Like and it's like it's in the film so many times in so many scenes. And what's even more interesting is that later on, when the Gorgonites, the little the the so called bad guys that are actually technically the good guys, are they're asking Alan questions about the nature of their reality about Gorgon. And they, and they keep asking him, and what's beyond that? And he's like, oh, that's the window. What's beyond that? Oh, the trees. What's beyond the trees? Oh, there's a field. What about the trees? Oh, there's a river. Oh, about the trees? And eventually they get to Gorgon. That's what's beyond there. But, but that's kind of like a, a metaphor for like life or like the Matrix, for example. Like what's beyond the Matrix? What's beyond God? What's beyond the universe? And so asking these really deep questions. And what was really interesting was during the scene where he was questioning those things, they had another shot of that sign saying question reality, but only the question was visible, if that makes sense. Only the first half of the sign. Like everything was so deliberate. It's almost like there was more to that film than met the eye and it went over everyone's heads, kind of like Starship Troopers. They didn't actually get the satirical nature of the film when mm. it first released. Right. Yeah, I, I remember that scene as being like kind of like a, a God thing or like a belief thing where the, you know, he kept asking the question, you know, what's beyond that? Mm. What's beyond that? And then finally the kid says, well, I don't know. And then he said, go right. again. And it's like, yeah. uh, that's kind of like how, you know, people's belief in God works, you know, like, you know, what's at the beginning of time. And then they, you know, we go back and trace back the steps all the way to the big bang. And oh, what was before that? Oh, and then th there's God, right? Like <laughs> there's, you know, just keep keep on going further and further until there's no explanation. And then that's where God is. It's kind of like that's where Gorgon is, yeah, right? Yeah, God of the Gaps, kind of. <laughs> God but, of the Gaps. I, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> God of the Gaps. But well, interestingly, though, I also think that kind of pushes beyond that alone. I think it also starts to push into like the realm of Agnosia, the, like the, the, the God of unknowing mm. in a way. So I think, and that's kind of, you know, more agnostic in its belief structure. So I don't know, also kind of, even though it does kind of have like religious undertones, I also think that it's also pushing a different kind of narrative as well, like to, to question that narrative, that to question mainstream theology as well, mm -hmm. on top of that. It's interesting that the uh, the AI of the those little robots would have um, a belief, you know what I mean? That they would be able to have like a... Right. 
<laughs> you know, they don't know about it. They don't know where it is. They just believe that it's out there and that they need to find it. It's interesting. Well, well, in the film, so the, the one of the first major interactions between Archer, the leader of the Gorgons, and Alan, the, the main character boy, basically, he's trying to describe to him wind. And he's, and, you know, and he's saying, like, this is the wind. You, 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 it's, it's like blowing on my hand. And he's like, and he can't really, but he's a toy. He can't sense the blowing on his hand. He can't see the wind. And so Alan's teaching him, saying, well, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And that kind of, like, it gives, like, a sense of enlightenment to Archer, I guess, and helps the AI kind of, you know, develop another layer, level of sentience and like, starts mm. to question his own reality more and later on says to alan about gorgon just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there right hmm. yeah it's a deep it's a deep movie but such a, a silly packaging you know what i mean it's, it's, it's funny well I, I, in a way i wonder if that's by design like much like starship troopers like kind of hiding its satirical nature under the guise of its its own aesthetic that was a great movie as well yeah a lot of great movies from that time period, but um, the only other AI movie I can think of from back then was uh, like Terminator, right? And that's a completely right. different. Uh, <laughs> they they have a completely different outlook on what AI means, whereas the Gorgons, you know, it's it's like the um, the GI Joe of the that movie, where it's just mm -hmm. all about killing and destruction, right? And the, that's Commandos, kind of the other. Yeah. It's, it's funny with that movie they're kind of showing both sides and both like uh or realities or outcomes of what ai could be in our minds yeah and it's also a lot of anti-war uh sentiment in that movie as well mm. there's a scene where in the girl next door's room there's like a big poster on the, in the background like um tie-dye poster with like you know saying about wars not I don't know, it's about, I don't remember the exact wording, but yeah, basically an anti-war message. And I don't know, I, I kind of got like a lot of anti-war vibes from the fact that, you know, they're trying to show that the commandos that are like have all this propaganda about destroying the Gorgonites and how they're these real bad guys and blah, 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 blah. But really it turns out these Gorgonites aren't so bad after all. Maybe like we're misunderstood and actually the commandos are the so-called bad guys. Right. Not to say there are any good or bad guys, but it does kind of challenge the pre-existing notion of um, people's beliefs and maybe also is a parallel to what was going on in the world at the time you know with um maybe the the beating drum of america's uh situation i don't know if like back then there was much anti-war sentiment oh, i think there was a little bit but maybe not as much as there was in like the 70s or something mm. yeah and i remember the main theme song of the of the uh movie was that like war what is it good for absolutely nothing that one right yeah, there was definitely a lot of uh, anti-war sentiment in the film, despite being a very Hollywood action kind of movie, which is what was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, what what kind of uh, AI do you think we're gonna we're gonna run into in the future? Is it gonna be Gorgonite AI or is it gonna be <laughs> GI Maybe Joe both AI? Sam. Maybe both, Sam. And who knows? We might have. It might, we might even have like a, a Commando GI Joe AI, which is designed to wipe out rogue AI. Mm. If that makes sense. And there'll be like an AI that's governing AI to make sure AI doesn't run amok. Oh, that's that's deep, man. <laughs> how can we how can we predict the future? I mean, it's impossible, right? It's impossible to predict what kind of craziness is going right. to come down the pipes. But, um, yeah, it's it's wild, man. Are we just in the future? Are we just going to be like a a backup to the to the AI? Where like if well, there was a the backup, if there we was like a massive EMP on the entire world and all the AIs get shut down, then they need someone to turn it back. You know, flick the switch and turn yeah. it back on. That's the only, that's I our think, only purpose. <laughs> I think Elon Musk has already touched upon that point of like maybe we are just a bootloader for AI, mm. and following that same logic, maybe that's already happened. Maybe the AI already did exist once upon a time. Maybe there was some kind of crazy big intergalactic war where they all got wiped out by some super emp weapon or something you know maybe they maybe they transformed a neutron star into like a solar uh, sorry like a uh, like a solar system wide emp that could like wipe out the entire like um ai race or something who knows who the, who the fuck knows but mm. um yeah following that same logic of well what if we're like the bootloader for ai well maybe it's already happened and we're the backup to make sure that it keeps coming back into existence over and over again 
Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's scary to think about, but it's also very necessary. Like people need to be aware of it because it's coming so quickly, and you can't yeah, put it back in the box. You can't put it back in the box, and it's Pandora's box. And I don't, th I don't think we can even, op we can't prevent the box from being open because there's all these different countries, there's these different like bad actors around the world who are mm -hmm. working towards uh, AI at the same time as we are. And like, One of yeah, it's it's scary. Like, did you hear about? Um, they they finally shut down the uh, AI research center for Google in China, right? But I mean, how many secrets were stolen? How much uh, progress was made by them during that? Uh, mm -hmm. A time when that was open, and yeah, there's there's so many cases right now of uh, AI researchers stealing away information to. Um, this is to quite China. common practice in the world, yeah. yeah. Um, and then China is advancing rapidly, so it'll be interesting to see where the, the landscape of the world is in twenty to forty years' time, especially as far as AI in China is concerned. Well, that's my fear: is just that. Uh, we won't even be the ones to activate the AI, right? Like we won't even know about it. It'll just be activated by some, yeah. you know, Chinese force, and you know they well, they'll be you know, they'll say well, like uh do you know the the purpose of you being born, this AI being born, is to you know uh, get our laws all over the world, or like enforce our law in the whole world. You know, it's just just an insane set of laws and principles that communism is right. birthed well, i think countries have promised like um i think it was like russia promised at one point like if they were the first to you know gain access to all this like ai uh, they would just, like, share the share the wealth with the world so to speak but i mean let's be honest that's not really what's going to happen whoever gets there first is going to act as like world police like america's doing right now and like or, or it could be like a cold war type thing where it's a standoff where it's like you don't use your ai we don't use our ai and if you use your ai then it will hell breaks loose because everyone's just going to bust out what they've been sitting on secretly you know what mm. i mean mm, yeah that's that's a strange concept i never even thought about that before is like maybe everyone would have like a the nuclear option will unleash mm. our agi on you if you release yours on us and everybody will be screwed you know like I don't yeah. know. And there'll be like AGI sentinels that are like monitoring all traffic to make sure there's no influence of other AGIs, mm. so to speak. That's that's wild because then they always talk like I've I've always heard about uh AGI being able to increase its own power, right? Like it improves on itself and that that's like the the basis for an AGI. What is an AGI? It's like something that can look at its own design and like improve upon well, yeah well, well act independently become, of any yeah. other actors right right and, and become stronger and stronger and you know more powerful and so that would be i mean what would be the limit on that what would be the sort of um yeah what would be the limit like is it going to be power well, it, who, whoever has enough like well, electricity or like computing power in their country will well, limit the the size of the ai <laughs> But yeah, I mean, obviously they could try and bottleneck the AI through the use of things like bandwidth, either through how much electrical current it's allowed to consume or, you know, at like the speed of internet it's able to be linked to, so to speak. But it doesn't really matter. Like eventually the AI might become smart enough to like think of loopholes of mm -hmm. getting around those restrictions, which is the problem. And it, you, no matter how much foresight we have as humans, we are going to make mistakes and we can have no idea of how the ai will interpret the directives we give it you could give an ai the directive preserve human life for all costs and the ai mm. goes okay well the only way i can guarantee that is if i put you all into a coma stick you in pods and you can have fun living in the matrix for the rest of time mm -hmm. yeah there's yeah it's very difficult to predict what an AI like just think about your own uh use of ai when you, for example, try to make like an AI picture or something like that, you might write down a prompt and get a completely different result than what you're thinking of. And just right. imagine that on like a society wide scale where you're actually doing something, you know, very complicated. That would be interesting. Imagine a future where the AI is controlling government and there's like government officials whose their only job is to like prompt the AI 
<laughs> because, you know, they like reach out to all of their constituents. They find out, you know, what's the biggest problem for you guys right now? What would you like to be changed about the, the world currently? And then they, you know, figure out what that is and write a prompt for the AI mm -hmm. in order to make those changes without harming other things. Do you know what I mean? And like, and then they vote on that and like pass that bill through Congress to like, have have a AI prompt to be added to the government <laughs> matrix. You know what I mean? The government AI. <laughs> well, that'd be freaking wild. Well, it's also you run into all kinds of problems because if you if you did have say some kind of like Sentinel program of like AGIs that were like governing other AGIs and preventing them from you know doing any too much harm, mm -hmm. you also run the issue of well then you've got to limit those AGIs so they themselves can't become a problem later. But that if they are too limited, they won't be able to necessarily tackle an AI that's really advanced. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's a bit of a weird situation the only way you could really get around it is if you could somehow house the ai within a simulate a simulation where the ai is convinced that it's still operating in base reality and is carrying out its directives normally and is unaware that it's within the training environment to see how the ai actually behaves and functions when giving those privileges and access the problem with that is you can never know for sure if the ai is actually aware whether or not it's in the simulation so it could just act like it's not aware of it's that's in the simulation and then just be biding its time and also using the simulation as ways of like practicing how it'll actually fuck you over when it gets out. Oof. Yeah, that's um there's no contingency plan good enough. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the problem. No matter how much we prepare as humans, we have to have the wisdom to realize we, we we're too fallible to be able to think of everything. And even if we do, there's the the issue of alignment and getting the AI to do what you want it to do. God. Yeah, it's tough, man. I mean, it's one of those things that's just outside of our control. And uh, thinking about it she too much, in control, right? Thinking about it too much will send you down a rabbit hole, and um, you know you won't be able to get anything done. But not thinking about it at all, I don't know if that's the Pretty right call the either. Sand. Yeah, yeah, that's not the right call either. It's um, it's it's one of those weird things. That uh, I think we're gonna see huge, huge uh, effects from it in our lifetime. It's gonna be really weird. At the very least, there'll be a lot of jobs that suddenly just go missing. I think we talked about that in a previous episode about like you know artists or you know like Uber drivers or truck drivers. That kind of thing will be maybe the first to go as well. So like entire industries will be turned on their head. That would be a pretty big upset to the social economic situation. And then you've also got. I guess the issue of there'll be new jobs available though, to be fair, like we did discuss that previously as well. Like basically um, in the future, it could be like people become like professional prompters, you know, like mm. being good at syntax and getting the AI to do what you want it to do. That might be a job in of itself. And if you're really good at that, maybe you don't even need to be hired because you're just making so much money from getting the AI to work for you. Right. Yeah. And I mean, even weird things that you're not, not even going to think of is like, uh, for example, like advertising might be, those jobs might be out the window, right? Like, I'm sure you can program an AI to decipher, you know, the, the or decode exactly what makes people click on something because it's all about clicks these days, right? And and yeah. build, a, build an advertising campaign that can totally route any uh, human-made advertising campaign and, like, get people's attention better than anything else. Like you've I'll already take seen it one it. step further than that. I'm saying. I don't think I think it's even more than that. Not only would they be able to like tailor make the the like bespoke advertisement, so to speak, better than any human can, they'd be able to build like data so many data points on the human that in question that they would be able to tailor make the advertisement for that individual. Mm. And they'd be able to really figure out that your political alignments, just just how you are on this every kind of spectrum they could possibly measure. They'll be analyzing all your Facebook posts, your X tweets or whatever like they'll be analyzing so much stuff and eventually they'll have a they'll have a really good read on you better than you know yourself and mm -hmm. once they've got that it's like having a full crystal ball and you're just fucked and society is just fucked because they'll be able to manipulate the masses and on an individual level right they'll be able to get you to buy whatever they want you to buy um think whatever they want you to think it's uh yeah that's scary that's scary to me that the you could take an ai and just tell it make money <laughs> you know make as much money as you possibly can i'm sure that there's somebody who's gonna do that if they have access to an ai you know just make money mm -hmm. and then in making money they're gonna change society so deeply 
and like <laughs> you know mind fuck us all so hard that uh we're just going to well, maybe this will um, spin happening does, on some level yeah, and then where does the money go well it goes to like one small group of people and the whole like imbalance in society becomes worse and worse and worse it would i mean i don't want to get too conspiratorial but it wouldn't totally surprise me if there was already say some elites that have access to some kind of agi and they've been using it to make money and mm. have basically been you know making sure it didn't get out into the public sphere too much maybe there is some kind of interaction on message boards anonymously or what have you but who knows but one thing i would say would be interesting to see if they were training the ai in making money in all kinds of ways like you know manipulating stock markets or like you know coming like building crazy amounts of shell companies that are all under these intricate llc umbrellas to like you know tax evade and make as much money as possible and i mean it's possible that that's already happening in our society right now and people don't even realize it mm. Oh, what the I mean, the AGI if it's if it's making money off of stock market or something, what's to stop it from, you know, re releasing thousands of news stories or something about a certain company in order to tank right. their stock price and then yeah, exactly. you know make money off of that or, uh, you know, beefing them up like making a whole bunch of news stories to make them more popular, you know, and get people thinking about them, and then you know, uh, making money off of sure. that. That's not illegal or or yeah <laughs> it's just... what's even more crazy is that that ai could create people out of thin air mm -hmm. like like how like ai generation is getting good enough where it can like more or less like you know create like composites of humans like right. out of like a database right mm -hmm. they're gonna basically have that okay, where it's like they make... create people out of thin air create like profiles like so that so then they could put a legion of followers they could literally like build not only in companies but they could give the illusion of success before they even achieve success because they could have like hundreds of thousands of followers and supposed customers and people supporting whatever their agenda is and they're not even real people but they can make it seem like they are yeah. and that'll be enough to convince people on the surface level yeah fake users <clears throat> plenty of fake users i mean they could even put with with how ai is going right now i mean the future is going to be there's going to be fake youtubers too right like you right. won't even know if the YouTuber is real or not. They might just be an AI-generated um, human, you know, spilling out a bunch of uh, information on certain topics and getting people, you know, involved in certain things or thinking about certain things in order to uh, make money off of them, right? Like to, to make money off of trends. It's, it's wild what's possible when you just start thinking about AI and AGI as like a money making tool or just just a tool in general for anyone to use it is a little bit worrying i mean it's going to be, we're, we're very quickly going to be entering into an era where we are not going to be able to trust our own eyes and ears anymore i think we already have entered that era it's just people haven't realized it yet like i don't think you can trust what you see and hear in media but people aren't fully aware of that yet and the ai is going to make that painfully aware very quickly mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a scary, weird time where everything feels unreal and a lot of it is unreal and it, it's so hard to parse out the truth. And I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why we want to make a podcast, right? We want to talk about this shit and try yeah. to figure out try to figure out what's real, try to make something real in a sea of just kind of unreal nonsense that's going on all the time i kind of feel like that's how a lot of communication and debates should be like you know essentially just people figuring shit out together yeah and of course we're gonna get things wrong guys we're gonna have uh mistakes errors but you know leave your comments Only human. yeah leave your <laughs> leave your comments down in the in in the comment section and uh be part of the discussion that's... life is up here but you can comment below yeah and no agi in the comments okay nobody no no comments from uh artificial people just human people how would we know saying how would we know <laughs> that'd be so convincing <laughs> yeah that's a problem right not a convinced. lot of a lot of weird, the NPCs. yeah a lot of um comments are feel like they're from bots <laughs> yeah, i know a lot maybe of not sophisticated humans, but... bots but <laughs> I, th I think a true AGI would be almost indistinguishable, though. Mm. Yeah, I think for so. Sure. No, you're right. I'm sure they would be pretty indistinguishable. 
which is also a very scary thought. Right. Well, let's let's move off of AI. I think you wanted to talk about <laughs> consciousness, right? Yeah, the nature of consciousness. Oh boy, that's a, a little deep dive, isn't it? Right into the deep end. Um, okay, so I find consciousness probably to be the most the area of most fascination and least knowledge available to it. And I'd, I'd be very curious to pick your brain about how you feel about not only your consciousness, but the possible forms of consciousness or what's different from a dog's consciousness to a fly's. Or I also wanted to talk a little bit about, how, about time dilation and how different species or different animals can experience time differently, like in the sense of like a time is like in a way experiencing a slowed down reality. Maybe that's why it's so hard to catch a fly or to, you know, well, I don't know. I feel like there's something deeper that we as humans aren't yet exploring and science has only barely scratched the surface much in the same way we haven't even explored the entirety or hardly any of the oceans yet. I feel like consciousness is even deeper than that. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes I wonder, like, have you ever watched Interstellar? Interstellar yeah. is a very interesting movie about um, that film. about time and um, the effects of gravity on time. And there's some things in it that weren't totally uh, accurate, but accurate. there's there's some interesting like time dilation ideas that they're working with, like being under a lot of gravity is uh, going to slow down time. Like it, it was funny, like pe people unpack or were unpacking it and showing the kind of errors with it, and <laughs> it, right. it really didn't cross my mind when I was. Um, uh, when I was watching the film, but um, it, it does not make a does doesn't make a lot of sense actually when you when you watch it. Um, like you remember the point where they had the uh, the giant black hole and they went down to the water planet and the water planet was yeah. um, you know under this massive amount of gravity that was uh, slowing down their time so dramatically that you know a minute down there was like years um away from the black wasn't hole it, well wasn't it was, wasn't it because of the proximity to the black hole that was yeah. causing that yeah it's like a it's the gravity um which is caused by the proximity to the to the black hole which is why um, the tides were so crazy on that planet yeah. like the same way the moon creates uh tides on our planet the black right. hole was creating these like mountain-sized right tides. waves yeah, yeah 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 but the strange thing was that the uh, like the people when they were standing on the planet were standing around like they were standing on earth. Whereas the, like a scientist was explaining that they would be crushed. <laughs> like they would be smushed to the planet because the gravity was so strong. Do you know what I mean? Like their, the proximity of the black hole would have um, been like, you know, a hundred times earth gravity or some, something crazy like that. And yeah, I imagine they wouldn't. <laughs> I, I don't know the exact. I don't know the exact numbers, obviously, right. but I can. Yeah, I could probably imagine like they wouldn't just be able to just stand there chilling. You no. know what I mean? Like they would need some kind of crazy, I don't know, exoskeleton suit just to hold them upright. Well, and maybe they wouldn't. Yeah. Even that wouldn't be good enough because like their internal organs would be destroyed. Exactly. You know what I mean? So exactly, there would be so much pressure yeah. on their lungs and stuff. They wouldn't even be able to breathe. You know, they wouldn't be able to expand their lung. A anyway. It's it's a great movie and it it shows, if not totally accurately, um, with the the human beings being there, but it it does show like the time dilation accurately, apparently. Right. So yeah, that, I think so. I think so. That's very interesting to me, and I wonder, um, if gravity has that much of an effect on um the the perception of time, um. Well, it time... opens up a lot of different ideas, right? Like, um, what a, what about a fly? Like a fly, I, I don't know. This is maybe coming, be, going to be sound like a stupid question, but a fly has a very very weak amount of gravity, and the gravity of the right. Earth has a very small effect on it. So, does it experience time differently, or is that totally out the window? I'm too much of a layman to, to answer that <laughs> accurately about an educated guess. But one thing I would say is that insects, especially insects smaller than flies, traverse through 
the sky very differently. And because they they have such little mass, they actually kind of move through the air as if the air was a fluid. So yeah. in a way, it's like the the sky is their ocean, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is some truth to because gravity is imparted onto them in different ways because they're able to move through this medium in a different way. For example, we reach a, an S, a terminal velocity when we fall through space and time in this atmosphere, whereas they don't. They are, remain stationary within that air, which is a fluid to them in terms of how they traverse through it. Yeah, that's, that's very possible. strange to think about. Like uh, flies and, and other bugs are so small that they... They don't even they don't even feel the effects of gravity. It's like they're floating, really, for most of the time. Like they yeah. they are flapping their wings, but they're the effect of gravity is so tiny on their body that they barely have to move at all to keep to keep floating to keep flying. But um, you know, I I I don't mean to go completely off topic here, um, away from the uh, consciousness idea, but I. I watched mm. a, a video that was really, really interesting. I want to um, lay this on you because I think you would really like this. Um, lay it on me. There was a, a new study about bugs um, where they were trying to figure out. They've been trying to figure this out for years. Why are bugs attracted to light? And they finally figured it out. Like, why do bugs fly around light sources um, at night? You've seen it. Everyone's seen it. Everyone knows it. Like, the bugs just come flying into your house if you leave the window open or whatever at like night and it's a light on. Flame. yeah so why why is that an ancient like that's been around forever people have been trying to figure that out even since ancient rome they've been trying to figure out why do uh bugs especially moths get attracted to light sources at night and they finally finally figured it out and it's actually kind of depressing um the reason why insects get attracted to light it's not actually that they're attracted to light but it's based on their evolution of course they have sensors on the top of their body that detect light mm. and the the light coming from the, sun, the sun is the the normal yeah. source of light and the bug it has mo a lot of bugs not all bugs not all bugs are attracted to light but um the ones that are especially attracted to light they have sensors on the top of their body and this is how they evolved flight they have sensors on top of their body so that they can uh fly during the day and they the sensors tell them if they're upside down or right side up so this is part of basically what you're talking about is that they don't really feel the gravity on their body right, right. That they when they're flying they don't they can't like innately feel that they are right side right side up or upside down do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like they I know exactly what you're saying. They're flying along. They're they might be upside down. They might not be. And the sensors are telling them that light is above you, so you are flying right side up. And if they fly upside down, their body automatically turns. Like it's a an automated system in their body that says like light must be on top. You know, light yeah. cannot be on the bottom of their body. So. They uh they just automatically turn and when they're flying at night and there's a light source, uh that is you know artificial you know a street lamp Things or something like that. So when they fly past it, the the lights changes from the top of their body to the side or the bottom of their body. They their body automatically turns so that mm -hmm. they're so that the light source is above them again, and so yep. they basically just go around in a circle unable to turn away because the automated like the their body has like an automated response while they're flying to have the light above them otherwise they're going to crash so they just they just keep going around and around and around and around um endlessly because they don't know uh you know they, they can't they can't figure it out they'll eventually like crash into it or crash into something else and the only way they can escape the light is by like a an outside force like a wind gust or something like that blows them far enough away to where the the sensors on their body no longer uh have that light you know um <laughs> no longer can feel that light source and and then they can you know reorient themselves and fly away yeah, much like us they are prisoners to technology <laughs> technology well it's uh, this, uh, <laughs> prisoners to the evolution right <laughs> 
prisoners fear yeah, yeah. base instincts maybe <laughs> yeah and, and and manipulated using technology hmm. yeah the the um base instinct just overrides their the, the wherever they want to go they want to fly forward but they just they have to turn they can't they can't uh, escape that loop it's um yeah maybe it's maybe there's a metaphor there but even in this conversation, there's a bit of a metaphor there because now we're going to go back into a loop back to AI and the problem being alignment, much like the alignment issue of these moths or insects having to align to these flames and being unable to really override that base instinct. It's, um, it's a little bit sad to think. And I'm, I'm kind of like bummed out about it actually now that I, <laughs> I know why. Like They're not actually attracted to the light. They're not like, ooh, the light. Let's go there. They're just like, I, I can't fly away. How come I can't fly away? I'm I'm flying away and I'm I'm here I am. I'm back at the light again. Like what happened? They're just totally lost. They can't figure it out. It's uh um... I, mean, I really I really do feel like that's a metaphor for life though. And I think that <laughs> in society and humans are experiencing that right now. <laughs> in what way, Shin? I think we're going in circles, Sam. I think we're all caught in loops, feedback loops. I think consciousness, the nature of consciousness could be described as a, a, fee, a sequence of feedback loops. And See how I'm keeping all this conversation tied together in a loop? <laughs> give, me a, give me an example so we can, uh, can discuss it. I think, actually, I think actually that's how scientists have unironically described consciousness as being a series of feedback loops. In what way? And I, uh, again, I'm, I'm so much of a layman, I don't think I could do it justice, but I could have a go. Um, okay, let's just say, if you want to look at it in, in terms of our day-to-day -day lives, well, we respond to stimuli in very similar ways, and we, we tend to fall in with you know, certain patterns of behavior, if you, if you like. And if you actually like lined up your day-to-day -day and like how much time you spent doing certain things or what you actually specifically did, sure, you're going to be doing certain things that are maybe more spontaneous than others, but I assure you probably the major vast majority of you listening probably are falling into the same patterns of behavior, even if it's taking or manifesting itself in different forms. So... Let's say, for example, you're a smoker and you, you know, you regularly go to the shop and you go to the shop and you, you buy a drink and you buy a pack of cigarettes or whatever. And this is like part of your routine, your habit. You're like a, a record that's stuck on repeat. You know, you're going around in circle, circle, circle. But maybe you give up smoking or something. But then you keep, but you're still going to walk to the shop, you're still going to buy a drink. But maybe you replace the the cigarettes with chocolate or something. But you're still fulfilling the ego. You're still caught up in the, the, that feedback loop of trying to satisfy the ego, regardless of what form that's taking. And I think that's what happens to us in our day-to-day -day lives. We're like unable to, to, to switch. I think there's a 21 Pilots song where he, there's, a, there's a, a few bars where he says, um, uh, switch the beat to, to avoid yesterday's dance, so to speak, or keep the beat to repeat yesterday's dance. Hmm. No, I, 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 is that an example? <laughs> I, um, I, I'm just, I'm just exploring spitballing. that topic with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking about, um, your earlier question when you were talking about, uh, you know, what is consciousness and do, uh, animals have consciousness? Do insects have consciousness? What, what is the, like the basis level of consciousness? And I'm thinking about like, that bug flying around the the light source and does he actually have consciousness is he thinking you know why am i stuck here you know why can't i go to you know fill fulfill my needs like i'm hungry i need to do this i need to do that what well, what are they what are they the actually core, thinking is there thought there is there i, mean, I don't know what, there? i don't <laughs> i don't know what they're thinking i think that's the problem is that science doesn't know and mm -hmm. even if you go and talk to you know scientists that specialize in these fields i'm sure they can give you their opinions about these things but i assure you not many of them could you know back that up with too much evidence but basically the there's a, there's a core idea behind consciousness I'll, I'll read this to you now i quickly looked it up for you so the core idea is that consciousness the core idea is that consciousness arises from a feedback loop in which our mind's ability to externally communicate an idea connects internally with the same mind's ability to receive ideas from others. Hmm. 
So consciousness is like I can listen to an idea and then express it to someone else. Is yeah. That- it, it kind of goes back to that whole conversation we had before. I'm not sure if we did that off podcast, um, but it was about, um, you know, remember I told you about how uh, there are, there in, in my particular belief structure, I, there is no teacher and student. It's like you're all just continuously like learning from each other in a way. There is no like actual label of teacher and student. And this kind of ties into this in a way. Mm. So consciousness is about uh, communication. Well, you could you could even argue that I mean this again would be more my opinion than anything based in fact, but you could argue that consciousness is in a way a point of attention of the universe trying to communicate with itself. Right, because everything is part of the universe. So you're a point in the universe. I'm a point in the universe. We're communicating with exactly. each other. Exactly. We're the universe communicating with itself. So we have the illusion of individuality of you, you are say, and I'm Jean, but the reality is maybe we're the same thing, just communicating from different points of reference. Right. That's like the, the yoga principle, the unity principle, like I'm you, you are me, I'm everything. Exactly. That sort of unity ideology. Um, I, I think that's a good way to, to think about things if you're trying to gain like a deeper uh, sense of, um, of everybody and and like a what is empathy like a deeper empathy for other people to be able to think inside their shoes like as though they are you i think that's a really good way to to think in order to you know be harmonious with other people and to relax your uh fears angers you know those type of things with what other people are doing is to just think of them as a part of you and 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 think of the world as you know, a part of yourself to open up yourself to be, uh, to to let other things be a part of you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter through what lens you are doing that. You could dress that up and give it any aesthetic you wanted. You could right. say, for example, look at it from like, oh, I'm I'm you in another life. If you want to, if you want to do it in like a reincarnation lens, or you could say, um, you want you just want to treat someone as if you were treating yourself because it's not necessarily you but it's like another expression of you like say you know a different version of you not necessarily you in another life but just a different expression of the same internalization right so the ability for me to uh, like receive that idea and then communicate that idea um means that i'm conscious right but uh well i I don't know that i don't know that it does i think also it's very for us to prove consciousness i think it'd be very difficult for us right here right now for us to prove that we're both conscious i think we could do a very good job of it and maybe we could convince the listeners that we are but whether or not we actually have proven we're consciousness is another matter Hmm. i'm just thinking like obviously a bug can't understand that idea and and you know give it back to me right but I don't know. There are other ideas that bugs can communicate. For example, like a a bee can communicate with another bee uh, about like mm-hmm. the source of nectar in a certain area, right? They have a a dance that they do um that tells the basically the direction that you need to go based on the sun and then right. the length of uh, or the the distance uh that you need to travel to find this nectar. And They can go to the hive and do the little dance. And then the bees will look at that, see the dance and go, oh, let me go check that out. And then they actually fly in that direction, that amount of distance and find the nectar. It was very interesting um, that if bees can communicate, are are they conscious? It's um, it's an interesting idea to, to, to wrap your head around, to try and wrap your head around. I mean, and those are just the ways that they're communicating that we're aware of mm. as well. Mm-hmm. It's just what we're aware of that they're doing. So I guess I guess it's kind of like you could look at it from the angle of, say, uh, technology. Like, it's, it's, you know, not very, uh, not very uncommon thing to know that the military is sitting on, like, prototypes and stuff. That's probably, like, 30 to 50 years in advance of commercially available technology, right? Mm-hmm. Or much in the same way of, like, that's just what we know about. Imagine what we don't know about. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I 
I imagine there's some ridiculous uh, stuff that they're hiding from other countries around the world, of course, by hiding it from us as well, like uh, programs that are beyond our understanding. Like, have you heard about um, the, uh, what was it? The I don't know what you're going to say, but I can't remember what it's called. The Cuba, um, there was like a Cuba embassy or something like that. The embassy yeah, in Cuba, the sonic, weapon, sonic thing. weapon thing. Yeah, that was uh, that was I know pretty exactly wild. What talking about. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Um, yeah, and, and maybe that stuff goes on more than we're we we even aware of. And one thing I thought was really fascinating, a little callback to the Small Soldiers film. There is a little scene in that where the the commandos like commandeer a mouse trap and um, use it as a catapult to fling sleeping pills into the glasses of water of the the, the blue-pilled people in the world, kind of right. representing society that are consumed by technology and just going along for the ride. And it's kind of funny because in the film, they literally end up falling asleep, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, And also, by the way, the pills in which they were flinging into the glass were blue, just pulling mm -hmm. them out there. Um, and yeah, I, just, I, I think there's so much like undertones in that film which are touching upon what we're talking about now it's kind of hard not to bring that film up mm -hmm. yeah that's uh that is a lot of <laughs> that really wraps back around to the whole matrix thing right like the blue pill red pill exactly. thing. that's that's very funny um i wonder if they were fans of that movie or did that movie come out before or after the matrix uh small soldiers was 98 and the Matrix was like 94 or something like that. I can't remember. 99. 99. Okay. All right. I'm wrong. That's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. Small Soldiers had a budget. I'm not, I'm not even looking at it now. I just know because I, I, we, my cousin and I looked at this up before. Um, they had a budget of about 40,000 pounds and they made about 30 million. Sorry, 30 million pounds. 40 million pounds and they made about 30 million profit. So it's quite a decent, but it seems like it was almost a propaganda piece. But what's strange about it was that even though it seemed a bit like a propaganda piece, it almost seemed like a, almost like an anti-war and anti-propaganda piece at the same time, kind of like a satirical nature that Starship Troopers had. So kind of an interesting vibe. And it was also interesting you brought up Terminator earlier mm -hmm. because there's a, a game that's that's really popping right now, Hell Divers Two. Right. I actually tried playing it recently. It is a good game. And one thing it's it's oh my god the, the amount of like Starship Troopers and Terminator mm -hmm. influences in that in that in that game alone are astounding. Like I don't know, there's some crazy synchronicities going on right now. Saying and it's interesting that one of the games popping off right now are, are, have these kind of influences from these kinds of films. Right, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I did see that there's like uh, an AI in the Hell Divers Two. I haven't played Hell Divers Two, but. Uh, it does look like a very fun yeah. game. I might check it out at some point. Um, yes, yeah, four-player co-op shooter. It's a very good game. I'd recommend it to anyone. It's very interesting, though, that they have that uh, that aspect as well, like adding on to the whole Star Troopers vibe. Adding AI into that is uh, an interesting dynamic. I wonder how like the AI and the the bugs get along, or do they get along, or do they fight each other? Well, they don't. It's like there's two factions you're fighting against. So you're like mm. Super Earth, and you you're these hell the elite hell diver team, and you you got you got to go out and like secure these planets. And it's interesting because it's, it's done in the style of like a D and D campaign, where there's like an actual game developer that's playing the role of dungeon master, and he's like setting up like the task of Super Earth. Like this is what you've got to do, and you've got this time limit to like get control of these planets, and you get rewards if you do it, and you. And you're also contributing to the war effort of hundreds of thousands of players while you're doing your you know, campaigns and leveling up and whatever. Right. Well, that's wild. I wonder if in, at some point, like, Super Earth will be uh, under threat, you know? Like, they'll, they'll yeah, be like an be invasion or something. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you've got to defend it and what have you. That would be wild. Or maybe that happens if you don't secure the control of those planets. They gain more control closer and closer to the Super Earth until right. eventually they attack Super Earth. Because there are, it's like a grid system, so it looks like they could conquer more territory on the grid and gain cl closer access to Super Earth, and eventually, like in Starship Troopers, eventually gain access to launch an invasion on Super Earth. Right, that's wild. I wonder, that's really cool, man. I wonder what's going to happen with that. That would be, I mean, that's that's an idea. I don't think that's been played with. Um, not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. Yeah, it it feels like um, in a lot of these MMOs. They're, the the parameters are kind of more set, you know what I mean? Like they're very they're very set up, where the right. 
like you know they do like a wow expansion or something like that and everything changes but it's exactly how the developers um decided it, it and yeah. it's not it's not uh really affected at all by the player the players are just kind of experiencing the what the developers decide to is going to be the new expansion but hell divers too it sounds like they're um in conjunction like oh the you know the dungeon master will see what the players are doing and then react to that which is exactly uh, more interesting yeah and i'm really vibing with that so far i've only played it for like one evening but mm -hmm. i can already and the difficulties as well like i was playing it on hard with a group of friends that already leveled up and i was like oh this is pretty tough and then i, I looked at the actual difficulty slider of all the possible difficulties and, and hard was like number three of nine wow it oh, was like, whoa, okay, okay. <laughs> so this is game maybe catered towards both casual gamers and serious gamers alike as well. On top of that, right? That's that's very cool. No, I'm I'm very interested in the game. I'd like to try it. Um, maybe we'll play it on stream sometime. It'll be fun. Yeah, I'll be down for that for sure. Uh, I think it's like thirty bucks or forty bucks or something like that. Pretty reasonable. It's it's been crazy the the way that games have been inflated recently. Like the prices right. have been going up and up and up like crazy. But it's good to see like some some developers that are you know really taking new ideas and putting things together and then putting out a product that's not insanely high priced. Like uh like something like Diablo Four. I know you played a lot of Diablo Four, but you've kind of let go of it and i saw that they're coming out with a new expansion that's going to be like 80 dollars again to pay the oh expansion. god no god no you couldn't pay me 80 dollars to play that <laughs> yeah it's uh it's crazy what the what blizzard is expecting these days from, from yeah. their games i mean don't get me wrong i love hardcore i love playing hardcore as you know but mm. yeah no, I, I, I couldn't get in I, I did it for a while but it's just it's just not for me mm. Yeah, I resisted the urge. I resisted the temptation to buy that game because I, I feel like Blizzard <laughs> is dead. I mean, the current dev team doesn't seem to be up to the task, so to speak. No, they they seem like kind of neutered. It feels like they don't no. have, they don't have the same spunk as they used to. Like I'm sure the Hell Divers team, they're like, you know, pulling out ideas. They're you know going around finding out what's the best way. Like let's let's you know let's think of something new let's pull out you know some, some new right. wacky ideas and try to make them work and i feel yeah, like the yeah. diablo or like blizzard development team is you know okay let's let's go back let's let's figure out what worked in the past and let's try to like rebring let's bring that back up again um yeah that's been tested you know that's been tried okay let's put that together you know you know what i mean like <laughs> they're really just formulaic in how they're making their games. They're not really thinking of new ideas or like trying to push the envelope at all. I, th I think there's a parallel with that in, say, cinema, especially uh, it's like superhero movies, for example. Like that, they're, they're falling into too much of like trying to follow certain templates or agendas and not really having that same kind of creative freedom to actually create something new. It's all just rehashed, recycle, upcycling kind of way of thinking. Well, that's something that AI might actually open up a Be lot good at tackling yeah it, it's I like think so too. uh not necessarily like making movies but in helping smaller teams to make better movies you know you well, can well, have that, like a that... really small team of artists and develop you know directors and stuff to to make like an amazing blockbuster movie um with just you, you know using a bunch of ai to bring their idea to life whereas it would have cost you know hundreds of millions of dollars to put it together uh you know 10 years ago or whatever that's well, exactly what I wanted to bring up in our talk about AI is how it is going to open up a whole can of worms in a good way for all these developers and independent companies. They don't need to be AAA titles anymore because right. they'll have the support of AI and it'll be it'll take the weight off their shoulders and give them the creative apparatus that they need to also have that in, uh, big powerful uh force behind them to propel them and not have to worry about not having these like big companies of shit tons of money to help them do all the shit because they won't have to cater to the the publishers anymore they'll just have to worry about making good games again and i think that's what we've been missing out on for a long time mm. uh, a lot of good games come out recently a lot of great games it's uh it's inspiring to see a lot of shit games that are very expensive but a lot of good games that are are relatively affordable which is Totally and they're not your play titles like hell divers. Yeah, hell divers entrouded like a bunch of different games that are coming down the pipe that yeah. are um, 
pretty awesome and not crazy expensive, which is um, it's refreshing, refreshing to see. I'm kind of excited for it. I think like there is a lot of things to be scary and, and skeptical, and uh, but I, there, oh, there's a quote in Small Soldiers. Another little callback here, where uh, um, the main the main character of the Commandos, Chip Hazard, kind of has this scene where he's like um, he's got one, he's got the girl tied up, and you know he kind of does this whole like little spiel about like, are you scared? Good, we're all scared. You'd have to be crazy not to be scared. And it's kind of like ominous and cool at the same time, you know. Mm. Yeah, it's it's like a war line for sure. It's yeah, like a war movie. And, and line. I think in the context of AI, I think that's very very appropriate. You'd have to be right. crazy not to be scared about it, but it's just, it is what it is. No matter what you're doing, you might lose your job. You might be, uh, you know, influenced or taken down a, a weird path by AI. Uh, yeah. I mean, everybody's got to think about it. I think you would be crazy not to be scared. Mm. At least to some degree. I'm kind of excited, but yeah, I imagine that everyone's right in feeling a little bit anxious about that because uh, jobs are at stake and people's livelihoods and what have you. But also, I guess, like the stability of the climate, I mean, could affect things on a political scale or social and economic scale that, and the likes of which we've never seen before. And we're going to go through this crazy, huge shift. There might be a, a shift into the golden era, era, kind of speak, or a golden age where it's an almost utopian thing where AI frees up. People would have more hobbies and more free time or leisure and, like, you know, a lot more like support for people with like mental health issues and stuff because a lot more money available or whatever but let's be honest the reality is probably will not be so much like that it might be more akin to like blade runner or something much more cyberpunk dystopian you know high tech low life and i think that's what a lot of people are fearful of but i also think in some way there's like a, a death drive that people have where it's almost like they want to manifest these realities i don't know what it is it almost seems like people want this to come about it's almost like subconsciously there's this want for destruction I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a theme going on. Like the whole, uh, uh, the whole kind of destructionist and like anti humanist uh, ideas have been getting pushed for so long is, um, yeah, it's, it's not good for anybody. Like the whole uh, environmental movement has kind of been hijacked by a lot right. of these people who just don't like human beings at all. Like they don't, they want to get rid of them. I was watching, you know, this is interesting because this really goes to uh, um, a British film or a British series that I was watching. And you should definitely check this out. Uh, you guys at home and shouldn't as well. Um, the three body problem. That's a, the Netflix um, version. I know it's a book as well, but the Netflix version that. has just come out and it is so, so good. Uh, it is crazy, crazy good. So much fun to watch. But um, without trying, trying not to spoil anything too much, is that uh, there's people who just hate society. They don't like society, and they want to see it all come to an end. Basically, they want to like they they have such a negative view of human beings and uh, right. of the, our like effect on the planet that they they would rather wipe everyone out rather than you know try to fix things or try to uh, help humanity and it's it's like interesting yeah it's it's um something that that's reminds, come up a lot yeah that reminds me of like a satanist ethos where like the belief is like it's easier to invoke the devil than jesus because it's easier to make everyone on the planet evil than it is to make everyone on the planet good mm. yeah it it's like, wow, we've, you know, look at what we've done to this planet. Look at all the terrible things, the, the species that we've wiped out. We should, we just shouldn't exist. You know, we just shouldn't be here um, because of the things that we've done wrong. We should cease to be alive. We should, you know, we should uh, encourage people not to have kids. We should uh, tell everybody that, you know, the planet is overpopulated. You know, we should cease using nuclear power and, oil and all that stuff just you know back off of all of that and uh, live uh, with less power with less electricity you know go switch over completely into green um, power even though it doesn't totally make sense in a lot of ways like <laughs> yeah let, let's just 
you know, we don't need to use all this power. We just, we should just, uh, you know, back off. We should then? slow down. What about my hot tub and Tesla? How am I gonna, how am I gonna power those? Everything's gonna take electricity, man. The more that we uh, develop as a society, the more electricity is gonna be necessary. Like the needs of elect. It's interesting yeah. to, if you can look at a graph of how much electricity people have used over time. It's been exponentially rising um, over the years, especially the last like 10, 20 years. It's been crazy how much power usage everyone's taking up, right? Like think about what people were using 20 years ago in terms of electricity, mm -hmm. like maybe a television, you know, uh, maybe their baseboard heaters or something like that. And, you know, that might be a few lights. Um, well, but now there's like, you know, fully integrated home systems of cameras <laughs> and computers. And, uh, you know, you've got your laptop and your PC and your game systems. You know, your uh, everything has a battery that's charged from a wall port. Like there's so much electricity uh, that you're using for your phone and for uh, all these other uh, extra things that make your life more interesting or better or, um, you know, more uh, productive, right? Your yeah, like the computers we're yeah. using right now. Like these computers we're using right now, right? Yeah. So the more electricity we use, the more productive we are. And the more productive we are and the more innovative we are, I think the better we can handle uh, the effects that we're having on the planet. It's just about getting more, like, clean electricity that's the most important thing i think like finding ways to create electricity that's less damaging to the planet um and that's quite challenging though right like it's because yeah. green energy on the surface is not what it seems for example like say yeah. the products requ the materials required to produce say solar panels or whatever what have you like you're going to find find some kind of ecological effect some way or another it, it's going to be a little yeah, bit tricky absolutely. to figure out exactly what's truly green you know what i mean right well there's, of course, nuclear energy is huge. Um, the amount of actual, uh, like, byproduct material is incredibly low. Um, that's a ton of electricity that can be generated that way. But even beyond that, of course, there's uh, fusion energy that's coming down. Uh, I mean, we don't we know want, how yeah. far we are along on that, but um, it seems to be just around the around the corner in a lot of uh, people's minds and in, in like the scientific community, they're pretty optimistic that they can get it, get it done here and, and make that a reality, which would be amazing. But um, just having those type of options and like increasing those is going to be our, I think our route to uh, making human beings more sustainable with the planet and not uh you know not destroying ecosystems and stuff like that but trying to eliminate everybody i think is just psychotic and um yeah it's it's wild to see people uh advocating for that type of thing advocating for the destruction of their country or advocating for the destruction of humanity you know the the elimination of uh people from the planet uh just doesn't vibe with me at all it's it's wild <laughs> No, I, I guess that you wouldn't be in Hitler's corner then. No, I mean, even Hitler, <laughs> even Hitler, I don't think wanted to destroy the whole planet, right? Like he no, still he, he, he wanted was just eugenicist, right? Yeah, he he wanted to make like a better place for him and his people, right? Like, I mean, people throughout I mean, history and up shit like that, Hitler Genghis Khan good, right? or something like that. I mean, all it takes to make someone look good is a few hundred years. You know what I mean? A monster can look like a good person in a few hundred years. Think right. about like you're, you're right. think about like the the Mongol general like Genghis Khan <laughs> killed millions and millions of more people, um, and now he's kind of like whitewashed. Like oh, he's uh, you know he opened up trade with, the, with Asia own. and Europe, and you know he did this and he did that. Like dude, the amount of people that motherfucker killed, like holy crap, he killed so many people. It's crazy. He, he, he changed too. He changed the carbon footprint of human beings on the planet. They reduce like the number of people he killed is just wild. But oh yeah, yeah, it just takes time, and then people will look at the the good things that came from that. Well, 
uh, Hitler, like the, the European Union never would have occurred without Hitler. You know, that type of stuff. People will say that in 100 mm. years. I don't know that I, from my my personal belief structure I, I don't want to try and ascribe <laughs> evil or good to anyone or anything mm -hmm. so sometimes I think even if something has a, a veil of evil on the surface I think that maybe those are necessary evils maybe it makes humanity come together for example or what have you like you know or helps like realign the current direction of the human race because you know it kind of forces like a, a revolution of ideas so to speak so I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to ascribe any evil, because uh, who knows? For behind, behind closed doors, maybe the angels and demons are all friends, and it's all like just you know part of the show, and it's like you know they're just orchestrating uh, fatalism acting out here on the the mortal earth. Mm, I mean, evil, evil is um, slippery. It's a slippery term, like. Mm. what you ascribe evil to like are we going to ascribe uh, let, let's say there's a an an ai that does come about an agi and its prerogative is you know create the ultimate communist utopia and you know it's created by china or something like that and it goes around just massacres everybody and totally ruins the entire planet um is that evil is that AGI evil? It's like it's done evil acts, but you know, is it inherently evil? Is it inherently evil? Is it an evil entity? Uh, is you know, is it a spawn of hell? Well, it, it's so hard to ascribe those things, but um, I guess it's it's just about the actions, right? Is it an evil? Is it doing evil acts? Um, then maybe it's well, evil. I think but who's the one doing the judging of what is who's the arbiter of evil who's the one saying what is evil and what is good and what gives them the right to ascribe evil or good onto others are they omniscient mm. well i mean that's the thing like the people who are uh planning or who are saying that um you know humanity should die out you know we should stop procreating we should stop growing uh we should you know, your human race should uh, cease to exist. Those people are thinking of humanity as like a whole and saying, yes, humanity does evil acts. And so then humanity is evil. You know, humanity doesn't deserve to exist um, right. without, you know, parsing out the nuance of like, well, those, some of those people, right? Evil exists, yes, but. Um, in order for good to exist, evil also has to exist, right? Like there are yeah. good people and evil people, and uh, evil acts yeah, and good have acts. To have and like what what we need to look for is for the amount of good to overwhelm the amount of evil. You know what I mean? Like we we want to have more good than evil. Um, I don't think that um, I don't think that evil completely overwhelms good in this in this world. I think there's a lot of good as well. I think so too, but I also feel like we should be more accepting of the evil, not as in like, oh yeah, it's great that we've got evil in the world, but just in like a, you know, not allowing it to, you know, instill a negative energy onto us, so to speak. One, I think that gives it power, and two, I feel like it kind of misses the point. I feel like a lot of things in the world are teachers in the sense of, any negative experience you've had could be something that you can grow from and develop and use to build resilience from. And I don't, I don't like the idea of that. We're, we're forced to interpret things as either ways or troughs. I think they can be both. I think something could be seen something positive that happens to you. That seems like it's so great. Maybe later on down the line really screws you over. Who's to say that thing was so good after all, maybe it just has the illusion of looking good and maybe you shouldn't judge by appearances. So, so quickly. Yeah. My, my late uh, grandfather on um, my um, grandfather-in-law uh, before he passed from cancer, he uh, often would talk about um, like his, his favorite Buddhist saying or like uh, his, his favorite story was about a man in a village who uh, had a, had a son and a horse and mm. the man you know, he was in the village, his horse ran away, and the villagers said, 
uh, you know, oh, that's that's terrible luck. Like, we're really sorry to hear that. And he said, uh, good luck, bad luck, you never know. And then, uh, you know, a day later, the horse uh, ran back with another horse, and now he's got two horses. Um, and they said, wow, that's great luck. Like, uh, congratulations. And he said, good luck, bad luck, you never know. And then mm -hmm. the new horse that uh, that horse brought back, uh, his son was riding it, and it bucked him off and broke his leg. And the, the villagers say, like, oh, that's such bad luck. So, so sorry to hear that. And he said, good luck, bad luck, you never know. And, you know, a week later, the army comes to recruit people for, for the war. And because his son's leg is broken, he doesn't have to go to war. And the villagers <laughs> say, you know, good luck, bad luck. You know, wow, that's so lucky. And he says, you know, good luck, bad luck, you never know. It's just every situation um if you can look at it uh from like a neutral perspective like we just don't know what this is uh what this is going to mean you know what this what what future effects this is going to have then you can have like a better outlook on life and you know not be so distraught when bad things are happening or not be so elated when good things are happening then you can kind of see mm. the force for the trees well, I think, I think deeper in that is the not having the outcome dependence as well, mm. right? Like it's not being so attached to that outcome. And like say in StarCraft, like if you do get too hung up on the outcome, every game you lose will feel bad. And it's like, but, but then you're going to detract away and lose sight of, say, the things you need to work on that happened during that game that you could have done. And do you know what I mean? Like you're not actually going to review what you could have done differently as, as appropriately because you're going to be in that emotional state of being caught up in the loss. Yeah. And equally with the win, you're going to be caught up with the elation of the win. And rather than actually thinking, okay, I won this game, but I could have performed better. I could have done this better and so on and so forth. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, that's the stoic principle is uh, not focusing on results. Right. Letting, letting go of results and focusing on efforts rather than results and uh yeah it's um it's definitely the way to improve is to to let go of those uh outcomes and uh and focus on what you can do to make yourself better because the better the better you are the the more uh, adept you are the the outcomes will become better and you have, anything can happen right just right. simple luck can cause you know wins and losses in life um just just random occurrences that have no uh effect on you or have no you can't affect them sorry like you have no control over them so uh you know getting upset about those wins and losses is just going to cause you to experience more hardship because you're not focusing on what you can do um, and, you know, you're just worried about things that are completely out of your control. So, yeah, I, I t definitely take that to heart. And I think that that's like, that's one thing that people do way too much. Like if they're thinking about, for example, thinking about the environment constantly, um, these type of things can lead you down a really dark path where if you're right. on obviously like just constantly thinking about how the environment's being destroyed or you're constantly thinking about like a war that's you know hundreds of miles or thousands of miles away from you and like making that uh, part of your daily uh mental your basically your daily mental yeah your meal for the day your mental meal you know what you're consuming into your head is news about those things all the time then what comes out of you is just going to be warped and very right. negative, you know? So yeah, it's important to recognize what things are in your control, what things are outside of your control and realize that, you know, not everything is as, you know, as bad news as it, uh, you might seem, right? Like you, you got to recognize like good news, bad news, you know, we'll see. Um, okay. This, this war is happening. This thing is happening is that good or is that bad you have to wait to pass judgment because you never know um uh, and just taking that mentality will help you to be more positive in your own life and like have more concentration on what you can actually do to make your life better and, and to make people's around you life better and you know and 
it, it's it's difficult. It's not easy. It's not. It's easier said than done. But I I think that's something that people need to work on, and I I'm trying to work on myself as well. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that being an issue in society at the moment. Uh, as far as the the control thing goes, though, I'm, I'm curious. Do you think? What do you think about? The, we were talking about the nature of consciousness, but human beings seem to be, at least as far as we are aware, out of all current life forms, we seem to have this uh, capacity to get in our own way, but also have control over some of our mental faculties in a way that other species don't seem to that we can fully understand anyway. Um, do you think that this is like both like a hindrance to us as well as being like a, a great evolutionary thing? Because it seems like humans naturally have this like uh, desire to be in control and that gets them caught up with issues such as attachment and what have you. And they can even like, you know, get in their own way cognitively because they're obsessing over certain things and not like freeing themselves up to focus on what they actually would be, would actually would like, you know, for more fulfill them or what have you. And like, rather than like spending all day on Twitter arguing about macro issues, they cannot, can't actually influence or have any real contribution towards, they can instead focus things on a more local level regarding those issues or their own lives. Yeah. I think you need to separate everything between things you can control and things you can't control. Um, right. Enforcing control over things that you have control over, like enforcing your will on the things that you have control over, is just discipline. It's it's controlling your own actions um, that are actually going to affect your life. And then uh, the problem is when you're trying to control things that are outside of your control, whether that's outcomes at work or uh, outcomes in the world, outcomes you know globally, things that are not in your control uh, trying to control those just leads to to pure suffering right like i can control what i eat today that is something i can control and that's going to lead to a better life if i control that properly if i control what i do in terms of you know this podcast or you know if i just decide to just mm. mess around and you know play video games or just you know be a complete degenerate and not get any work done then that that is something that's going to affect my life, right? Like I'm going to have a, a worse life if I don't control those things. So yes, the the fascination, like the the um, obsession with control is detrimental if it's control over things that are outside of your control. But it's very uh, helpful if it is things that you actually have control over. You need to control those things in your life. And I think that's where people get um, really messed up is like they're spending so much time thinking about and trying to have some effect, uh, which is right. to control something that is just way outside of their ability to control. And then they're completely ignoring the things that are within their ability to control. Um, and, uh, you know, their life is falling apart makes them even more anxious, makes them even more frustrated. And then they eject those frustrations out on, onto the world in trying to control even more things, you know, social issues or, you know, the, the government, whatever the government's doing at that time or, you know, something overseas even, you know, in another country or, you know, something a company is doing that they don't like. Yes, those things are important too. You know, you can voice your opinions over them, but trying to control things that are outside of your control are very like there it's very detrimental to your mental health and, and stability and your ability to control the things that are actually inside your own realm of personal control will be left un unattended if you're constantly looking outside of yourself how would you if you had to give advice to someone that maybe didn't fully understand what you were talking about, how, how would you describe to them things they could actually do in their day-to-day -day lives to start to put that into action? Like, what do you think are some like very simple things people could start doing to start to manifest that and you know, not just have to like assume what they need to do? Because a lot of people, ironically, maybe aren't good at control as well in the terms of their autonomy and thinking about what they should do without direction or what have you. So what, what would be your advice on things that people could do in their day-to-day -day lives to start to you know, create that healthier balance? It makes me, it makes it sound like, um, I, I don't mean to make people feel like a baby, but control your, your bedtime. 
is like the main thing I would say is like control when you go to bed because being a person, you know, it's very easy as an adult to just go to bed super late to like watch your phone in bed all the time and, uh, you know, stay up really late one night of the week or three nights of the week. Um, especially on the weekend, you know, you work all week and you, maybe you go to bed at like uh, 11 or 12 o'clock at night and wake up at six or s uh, seven in the morning and uh, go to work. And then on the weekend, you stay up till, you know, three, three or four in the morning and wake up at noon or whatever. These, these, this is, this is normal for a lot of adults, but I think controlling your own bedtime, like deciding when you're going to sleep and figuring out like a good bedtime for yourself you know you know you have to sleep right you're gonna have to sleep why what are you doing that's so important to your uh <laughs> at, at you know one or two in the morning you know what i mean these are the I mean, hours that are like you're you're almost kind of like self-harming at that point when you're staying up that late where you're you're not really getting a lot of shit done at one in, or two in the morning um but you're like you're kind of enjoying the fact that, that you're uh you're just up at that time you're you're doing something that maybe you shouldn't be doing you're kind of like reveling in the the time um of being up at that 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 late hour you know whereas you could just go to bed at uh 11 or 10 o'clock at night and wake up and do exactly what you were going to do at 1 in the morning but do it like in the morning when you wake up and it would be it would be a little different but it wouldn't be um you know it would be more healthy for your body, for your mental state, if you were to just control your sleep time. If you control your sleep time, like I'm going to go to bed at 11 p.m. every night of the week and I'll wake up at 7 a.m., you know, every every day of the of the week, um, that will increase your mental health. It'll increase your ability to control your uh, yourself. Basically, it'll help you to not you know, binge on snacks or to, um, to, to have like really poor sleep. Like sometimes if you go to bed at three, maybe you wake up at six and you've only slept for three hours and then you're kind of like sluggish and slow the whole day. You don't get really anything done. Um, just, just having a bedtime would be a great place to start. Um, and it doesn't take long before, if if you enforce it on yourself, if you really treat yourself like you're somebody who maybe you're in charge of taking care of, you know, if you were if you were in charge of like your kids or whatever, and you tell them like, no, bedtime is 10 p.m. Bedtime is this time, right? You can enforce your kids to go to bed at that time, but a lot of people have a struggle to do that if you're with with themselves. But if they were able to treat themselves like that, like they were their own child, like they were somebody that they uh, were in charge of taking care of, then they would get a lot more stuff done. They would have a lot more energy to uh, control their own actions and to do the best for themselves, to do what's right for themselves if they just get that sleep and get that cycle down. And if you do that for just a short amount of time, like not even a week, you sleep at the same time every single night, you find yourself waking up without an alarm after a mm. week. And like your body is ready to go and you'll have a lot more energy and you'll be, you know, on top of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that would be like the biggest piece of advice. That would be like the first step uh, to, to anybody who's trying to get their life in order, like trying to trying to figure things out and take control of what they can control. <laughs> I do actually agree with you about, about all that. Meanwhile, I'm sat over here recording this podcast at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. I mean, it, if you're getting shit done at 2 a.m., what you are right now, then I think that's good. Right. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people, they work like a nine to five throughout the week. And then on the weekends, they stay up really, really late and they don't, uh, you know, they, they kind of do whatever until 2 a.m., 3 a.m., drink or go party or something. And then their sleep is terrible for the rest of the weekend they don't get anything done and then uh you know they're struggling to get back onto the nine to five you know getting back to bed at the right time during the week i mean i know i know it because i've done it but i just right. feel like it's um yeah it's really detrimental to your 
your ability to work um, on things that are actually going to affect your life, like whatever hobbies you have, whatever things that you're trying to accomplish outside of work are actually way more important than the things that you're uh, messing around with at three in the morning, <laughs> you know, if you're just a normal person. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do agree. I, I do think, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I do think there's like a bit of death drive in people where we're doing so many things that we know are really not good for us and mm. probably even put us into an early grave or at least, uh, uh, you know, shorten our ability to enjoy life, so to speak. I don't know um, what's going on there. I, I also think that maybe there's some escapism going on. Like uh, they, they're, they're having these lives that are unfulfilled. So they want to stay up late doing what they want because that gives them the illusion of control, gives them the illusion of like being able to do what they want, if you know what I'm saying. There's a bit of denial as well. Like, oh, this mm -hmm. is fine. Um, that's not really going to have that effect on me. Um, but there's like a trade off, right? It's like your enjoyment of life and your experience of life. Uh, that um, might be diminished by like trying to stay alive for as long as possible you now for example for me like i'm not i know that if i went out running every single day and like had my cardio really really good like i'm probably gonna live longer you know what i mean but i'm not right, out there right. running every day because i don't like running <laughs> it's just the trade-off to me <laughs> the trade-off to me feels uh i mean it feels too steep you know maybe i will do some running i have done running in the past um but uh, the trade-off right now for me does it just feels too steep. I think that's what a lot of people are doing in their head. They're doing that like mental calculation of like, um, you know, it's also that you don't know when you're gonna die, right? You have no idea your own right. mortality, and a lot of people feel like they're never gonna die, and some people feel like, well, um, I'm gonna die of something. It might as well be from this thing that I enjoy, you know. I might as well just. Yeah, and maybe Enjoy that gives them now. a sense of control as well, because they're in a way like choosing their poison. But mm -hmm. I guess they also, but I guess also they, there's an argument to be said for. But what if you do like eat only vegetables and like work out and you're like super healthy, but then you get hit by a bus at like 35, and you might as well have just like lived a life doing what you wanted because you lived you you lived as if you were going to live to a hundred or whatever to like set yourself up for that longevity, but it was cut short by an exterior means. Well, I would take that argument and apply it to like work and i would also say like well if you were for example like eating whatever you wanted and being like a fat slob and you know mm. you would probably feel a lot worse during those 35 right. years if you were eating healthy and doing a lot of those things you would feel good during those 35 years so wouldn't you want to have 35 years of feeling good <laughs> over you know 35 years of feeling Kind of shitty well, and would, yeah. but I think if you're going to be a, a, a hedonist, um, then I think you should at least enjoy it. I think that's one of the issues is mm. that there's a lot of people out there that are mentally unwell and they're living like slobs or what have you, yeah. but they're not even enjoying living like a slob. They're not enjoying <laughs> sitting on the couch and yeah, like they're hating themselves the whole time. Yeah, that's the problem. If they could at least enjoy doing it, that'd be something, right? I think that's the <laughs> maybe that's the first step. If you are going to sit there and do these detrimental things, at least find a way of actually enjoying it. Because what's the point otherwise? Hmm. Well, I would take the argument, uh, what you're saying about like, uh, um, if you're just going to die at 35, why wouldn't you just have fun and apply it to like work? You know, if you're uh, working at a job right now, that's, you know, really shitty, you don't enjoy it. Um, you're not happy where you're working. You're not happy what you're doing. Like you could die by getting hit by a bus at any time, realize that whatever you're working for, whatever money that you're going to get uh, sometime in the future, maybe you're working towards paying off your house or you're working towards trying to buy that nice car or you're trying to, you know, pay for, I don't know, whatever it is that you're trying to make that money for by working that shitty job. Like you have to realize that you can die at any time and um, finding something that you actually enjoy, even if it doesn't, pay as much money i think is a better way to live your life you just i i just think about my own situation like how i've kind of switched off of uh working a job that i don't like and trying to make something out of my passion and if i died 
tomorrow, I don't think I would have any regret for doing that. You know, I wouldn't think like, man, I wish I would have made more money. You know what I mean? Like, I would think like, wow, I'm glad that I did what I wanted to do. Um, and I enjoyed the time. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I think that that's the right way to live is to find, find something that you can do. That's fun. Like I, I'm also just so, uh, I'm so, I, 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 it feels disappointing to me just to think about this is like people who did something who went to school for something that's not even really in their interests, like something like accounting, mm. you know, imagine a person who went to school for five or seven years or whatever to get, you know, a, an accounting degree. I, can, I don't even know how long it is. What is it? Maybe five years, four years. I can't remember what uh, an accounting degree is. Uh, yeah. I think you it's, have to do some... Strong. You have to do some ridiculous amount of extra schooling after you actually get your degree. Like you have to take all these like different courses and stuff to get all the, you know, different classifications for accounting so that you can do, you know, corporate or different. Anyway, there's a lot of schooling to go through. I don't think anybody is like excited about accounting. Do you know what I mean? Like it, I'm it's, sure there's some people, but maybe not <laughs> very many. <laughs> yeah. Out of the thousands, millions of accountants out there, I'm sure that, there are a few, but most people are not super excited about it. I think AI is going to take over accounting really, really quickly. And imagine Possibly. you've done all this shit to learn this shitty job that you don't like, and it just gets taken away by AI. Like an AI accountant can do your job uh, way better than you, way faster, and um, you're just out of a job now. Like this, these type of things can happen very quickly. It's not dying, but it's like your things are changing so rapidly um you got to do what you want to do you can't be fucking around with some some boring thing that you don't like doing and then you know it could just be swept away from you whatever you've worked on um on earning through all those countless hours of discipline you're wasting your discipline is what i'll say like all of that mm. discipline of pushing yourself to do something that you didn't want to do uh, in order to control the future, right? You're trying to set yourself up for a life that is... Which uh, is foolish, in my yeah, opinion. You're, you're, you're trying to set yourself up for a cushy life, right? Like, okay, I do this a degree, and then I get this uh, designation, and then I do this job that I don't like for 20 years or 30 years, and then I have this you know, nest egg of money so that I can do what I want to do right so that i can you know go to this finally place or whatever life. finally start enjoying life you're you're basically using all of your discipline on yourself to control yourself to control the future right and you're not even enjoying the present you're not you're enjoying doing. the present and you are doing exactly what we're saying is con trying to control something that is outside of your realm of control you don't know what's going to happen with your job you know you don't know what's going to happen with that nest egg like whatever you're saving if you're putting it into the stock market or you're putting it into a bank or wherever you're putting it that could be that could go away um if you're putting it into a house like the housing price can drop that can go away everything can go away crash. you can and it's all just a metaphor for death right you could also die um and never get to enjoy those those fruits of your labors right so what you need to do is enjoy the process of labor right you have to find like you have to enjoy the fruits but you have to enjoy the process as well so you have to find a way to enjoy the process you have to find something that you can do mm. that's enjoyable so that you can enjoy life while it's happening rather than uh you know try doing all this stuff to try and control the future yeah you're gonna have future plans yes you're gonna have those type of things but those those can change at any moment because the future is not certain the future is not in your control so try to just control the things that are within your realm, right? Control what you decide, you know, change what you want to do or change what you're doing so that you can do what you want to do um, so that you can enjoy yourself while it's happening. And you might be surprised that, uh, you know, those things might actually result in, you know, more beneficial outcomes, a better future, uh, even if it feels like a really dangerous or, you know, um, you know, a more uncertain future. Uh, the future is never certain, no matter how certain you think it is. Um, 
whether it's being an accountant and having a lot of money or whatever those are not certain outcomes yeah the only thing certain is change death and this moment now and this moment now and this moment now uh, and i think if people like live their lives more like they're having ceremonial tea or something and really going into that process more and enjoying those mundane details of that process is probably going to give them more power rather than trying to control everything and stop being so obsessed about the outcome like the the stimulant of that caffeine that you're trying to get from that tea in the first place yeah we were going to talk about stimulants that was another yeah. thing on the agenda here so that's a nice segue um i was teeing you up <laughs> so uh tea and coffee stimulants that are used in every single day life um i feel like they're under explored in terms of their effects on the body and the effects on the mind right um i feel like people are just kind of phoning it in and, and just doing kind of what everybody else is doing in a lot of cases and you know consuming large amounts of coffee consuming large amounts of tea without really exploring the effects on their own body and just kind of like taking a moment to think about like oh what is this actually doing to me because it, it does have a really serious effect on your mental state and your body as well like let me give you get, let me give you an example here Shun. so Go for it. um my wife is a really big uh enjoyer of uh black tea like she likes uh earl gray and oh yeah okay she, tea. she drinks earl gray all the time and uh when we were living together at one point uh, she was drinking tea like maybe three, four times per day. Just, it's just quite a lot of caffeine. Just quite a lot of tea. And uh, she was having these really bad um, like bowel problems. Like she was having a really hard mm -hmm. time in the bathroom. Uh, she was you know, struggling a lot with um, constipation. And she, you know, we were, we were looking at our food. And going like what what are we eating differently like what is the what is causing this what's the problem and we're thinking about it a lot and changing our diets and like trying to figure out uh, what we can do to make that problem go away and then i think we finally talked to somebody who uh, mentioned like uh, what are you eating on a daily you know um and what are you drinking and she's like oh i drink tea and how much tea like three four cups per day and what kind of tea is it it's earl gray and oh caffeine irritates your bowel caffeine is a bowel irritant right and it will cause problems with your bowel if you're drinking too much of it per day and like wow i had no idea about that never <laughs> explored it before and yeah she stopped drinking tea immediately went away so the, the, that's just like a small example of uh, we just don't have the full uh, idea a lot of us are just kind of following along with what other people are doing and not really thinking about um, caffeine and other stimulants and what they do to your body. Yeah, I can't remember if I brought up that story on the podcast about the heart surgeon. I think it was, maybe, I'm not sure if it was a heart surgeon, but it was a surgeon. And um, he ran out of gum and he usually chews gum to help him concentrate while he's working. And he asked one of the med students for some gum and got given some gum and turned out to be nicotine gum, unbeknownst to him initially. And he said that he was able to finish the operation like three times as fast with like the kind of intense focus that he didn't even think possible. But even though it helped him work faster and work more efficiently and have that higher sense of attention, he actually, it actually kind of scared him and made him not want to even touch that substance again, even though it did have that effect and helped him perform it. It almost was scary to him. Now, this is something I've never experimented with because I never smoked um, cigarettes or anything. Um, nicotine uh, as a, I can as a stimulant that. yeah it's um like, explain kind of what the effects are of nicotine and and uh, how how you've experienced it well it definitely gives you kind of like a head rush and if you say you haven't had any like nicotine for a long time and you go back to like trying to smoke the way you smoked before it will make you feel so lightheaded it's enough to put you on your ass it's like it, the the intensity of the effects are so quick as well it's not like drinking alcohol where it kind of creeps up on you and suddenly it hits all of a sudden you know it's actually like quite instantaneous and in fact in the uk uh, we don't roll blunts typically like that people nowadays do it's more mainstream to roll blunts these days because it's you know it's been 
because of the influence from like America and what have you and rap culture, it's now much more like acceptable and knowledge. There's much people more knowledgeable about even just rolling blunts and stuff. So people do that more now. But in general, we used to only roll joints, which is tobacco mixed with marijuana. And that gives you a different kind of high. You don't have this kind of like halo cerebral high of just the fuzziness in your brain anymore. You have this intensity of this sense of focus and it kind of gives you like this different like sense of being a pilot in your own mind almost. And yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how I'd put it, put it into human words, but I would definitely say it's it's so potent that I'm surprised that there's people out there that are anti-drugs, yet they have like cigarettes or caffeine or what have you. And it's kind of weird because they don't consider these stimulants to, to fall under those same categories. They just they just want to say, oh, like weed's terrible or drugs are terrible. But meanwhile, they're happily sipping their tea or happily, you know, tooting their cigarette. Mm. That's interesting, the nomenclature there. Uh, I, I was heard that it was spliffs are what is uh with tobacco and i was yeah, thinking of a, spliffs as well I was, I was thinking yeah. of a joint as like uh just a purely weed thing but a blunt right, in, is in, like a fat one i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah in the uk if you were to say joint they would assume you meant tobacco mixed with oh, really? weed is what i'm trying to say That's in the uk it's obviously we call it a spliff obviously we call it a spliff but if you were to say the word joint to the british person they would have probably assume you meant tobacco mixed with weed Hmm. unless you said blunt i see i see yeah it's uh it is strange that people don't um don't internalize that like as that uh these things are drugs and they get really like uptight about certain drugs uh while you know utilizing their drug of choice constantly but that just goes to show you um like my earlier point is that uh, people are not thinking about these things as drugs at all and they're just kind of utilizing them as like a cultural thing without uh, thinking about the effects that it's having on their body. So somebody like uh, my uh, uncle was drinking like six cups of coffee per day um, when he was doing programming. He's a programmer for like a big company in Canada. Um, and he's drinking, you know, every single day, six cups of coffee. And I'm sure that's doing some really harmful yeah. effects to his kidneys and to Probably. you know his uh colon and all kinds of different stuff like that's causing a lot of issues for his uh, uh his, everything that needs to deal with um urine and um and cleaning the blood and and excreting uh that drug right but he didn't even think about it for years and years and years, like maybe 15, 20 years doing the exact same thing. And then he tried to quit coffee because he was having some of those problems and just, just ruined him. You know, it, it totally like, uh, -huh. was like a massive undertaking for him to try and just quit coffee, which is not what you think about when a lot of people think about when they, um, think about drugs, right? Like they think about, oh right. yeah, it must be so hard to quit heroin or something like that. It must be so hard to quit uh, weed or it must be so difficult to quit uh, cocaine or something like that. But they don't really think about the drugs that they're using all the time and actually being difficult to, to, to stop. Well, the dependencies on those substances manifest in different ways. For mm. example, uh, weed is a psychotropic, and you don't, you can't really develop a physical dependence on it, but you can develop a psychological dependency on it. So, and that could be that could happen to a lot of drugs. You could develop these psychological attachments and dependencies, where, as far as you're concerned, you need this to survive. And yes, um, there will be chemical imbalances in your body that become affected by not taking that substance anymore. But within depending on what the substance is, within a few weeks, your body will level out again. So then it's purely psychological and psychomatic how you deal with that afterwards. Well, let's talk about um, our own uh, experiences with like caffeine and stuff like that. Like, um, uh, I have been... I used to drink coffee a lot as a kid, mm, by the way. My, really? my dad my dad was a record producer and um, I went, I used, to, I used to chill at his uh, studio and he used to have, you know, like a pot of coffee all the time, you know, drip coffee, right? Mm -hmm. Like a pop of coffee machine. 
And as a kid, you know, I was helping myself to a coffee all day long. So there was there was times in my life as a kid, I, I did consume quite vast amounts of coffee. Hmm. And how did that affect you? I, I almost feel like it, it, it both... I don't know. I don't know exactly of all the effects it had on me, but in a way, I do feel like it maybe increased certain areas of development and maybe decreased others as well. Like I feel like it maybe gave me. I remember watching a lot of because um also had access to like uh, films to watch because he had a like a a TV with a, a built in VHS player, you know, like a combination mm. thing, so I could watch VHS tapes while chilling in the studio while he was recording in the other soundproof rooms. And I was watching all kinds of films, interesting. one of them being Starship Troopers, uh, another interesting one, I mean, interestingly enough, of Adam Sandler, Airheads, I remember quite, that's a, a funny film, Airheads, if you ever want to watch a weird, wacky film, that's a good one. Um, but I remember like, there's a film called, it was a Hellraiser, I'm sure you've heard of Hellraiser, and I was mm. thinking about this film when you mentioned it earlier, because uh, when you mentioned, um, we were talking about, you can't put it back in the box. And as mm-hmm. soon as I said the words, you can't put it back in the box, I was thinking of Pandora's box and also Hellraiser, and the whole pinheads thing is, you know, you open the box, you summon me. And it's like Hellraiser in a way is like representing AI and we are like summoning AI through Pandora's box. And once we've opened this box, it it can't be put back in. And it's like a, I don't know, like, yeah, in a way, I, I think even from a young age, because I was consuming caffeine, it gave me like a higher attentions uh, it was almost like it, maybe even it helped me develop my ADHD I don't know but certainly made me have a different kind of attention span ways of interfacing with the world slightly I think I think it has a, a profound effect and people don't realize it the whole rise of ADHD is very interesting as well like how much ADHD has become a part of uh, society I, I think we're programming people to have it essentially mm. like the, the whole like tiktok brain meme i think is very pertinent here i think that uh another drug that is uncommonly discussed that may be having a big effect on that as well as sugar but the amount of refined sugar that's going into so much of it, yeah. yeah refined sugar is a huge thing and uh ve- vegetable oil as well there's like certain um vitamins and minerals that actually get depleted in your body when you consume large quantities of these things like vegetable oil or sugar uh your body gets depleted of those minerals and uh, it actually causes your body to to crave food um when you run when you run low on these minerals and that actually causes you to eat more and if you're if your only source of food is more refined sugar and vegetable oil um products Mm. i think that is what really fuels the obesity epidemic is like you eat food that depletes you of these minerals which makes you hungry you're not actually hungry like you're not you're not in need of calories you're hungry for those minerals your body doesn't have like a a, 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 there's no like natural no there is a natural source but there's no um natural signal that your body can send you besides hunger that will for that will get you to consume those minerals right like uh, where we where we've evolved all you need to do all your body needed to do was we need x mineral we need uh x thing we just eat and when we eat we'll get those minerals you know but if we whatever we're eating is constantly depleting us of those minerals then the only and the only uh signal that our body can send us is hunger in order to try and acquire those minerals then it's like a feedback right. loop right where you get more <laughs> depleted you get more hungry and you just keep getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and i, I think that's actually the that's the feedback loop that's causing the epi- obesity epidemic and those those foods are not only causing the obesity epidemic but also causing things like um adhd and other you know mental disorders uh, anxieties and stuff like that that are uh Quite inherent possibly. in our culture right now it's just everywhere right. yeah. and, and corporations know that that's also highly addictive those fats mm-hmm. sugars and what have you there's a highly addictive and going to be great to put in their products to sell well so we're just going to get a feedback loop of more of that mm-hmm. so we're going to get more of what we want and less of what we need and we're creating this service-based industry of just catering to a hedonistic desires as opposed to 
our human needs and your body is not really well attuned to to be able to communicate with you very effectively you kind of have to do a bit of heavy lifting to actually pay attention to your body and uh, i think this is the thing we're lacking as humans is this level of like self-awareness introspection required to actually be more attuned to our needs and what our, our bodily functions for example when we're going to sleep your body can't really tell the difference between you falling asleep and dying so there's lots of times where your body will like jolt you like you're uh, all of a sudden and it's like your body's way of like making sure you don't die but um there is also another function where it kind of like makes you want to like toss and turn because that's like your body's way of like checking to see if you're actually still asleep because your body's not aware of if your mind is actually asleep or not it kind of needs to check that before it actually goes through its other processes which is how you can induce like sleep paralysis by just having the discipline to remain perfectly still i've never heard of that before that sounds interesting though um yeah i i experimented with lucid dreaming and stuff a while ago and know a little bit about this stuff yeah i did uh i did a little bit of that as well um had some lucid dreams that's a, that's another thing that's like if i had the discipline to do that i think that would make my life a, a bit better but at the mm. same time it's like uh maybe the juice is not worth the squeeze i don't know um <laughs> Well, you can have lucid dreams about trying to induce them as well, right? Mm. And uh, if anything, the problem becomes memory because you forget about, I don't know, like they say 90% of your dream within like, you know, the first 10 minutes of waking. So unless you're like keeping a dream journal and writing down your dream signs and what have you, it's kind of hard to, you know, have like truly lucid experiences. But if you were having the discipline to do all that, it's possible you would notice, oh, hang on a minute, I'm lucid dreaming a lot more than I thought. I'm just not remembering it. I'm able to notice the signs to become aware enough in my dreams to be lucid long enough to start to nail down these dream signs and actually start to recall the experiences through the use of dream journaling or what have you. But to be honest with you, I'm the opposite. I'm I, I'm avoiding my dreams. Like uh, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I, I smoke cannabis is to avoid my dreams. And I, I kind of have this like subconscious process of when I wake up, I I. I and I can do certain things to make sure I avoid, avoid remembering the details of the dreams too much because I have quite quite intense dreams and they can be uh, disturbing to say the least and mm, some of them can be quite apocalyptical and negative and I don't like to be too negatively influenced by my dreams. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's, it's weird. Sometimes I have dreams where I did something um that's uh, actually quite like um maybe it's something that i wanted to do or maybe it was something that i shouldn't do in real life and then i can't remember if i actually did that thing or not and like i'll I'll kind of double check myself like did i actually do that and then oh wait i think that was a dream actually you know later i don't remember that no. actual dream but i just remember the event taking place and like i i have to kind of like triple check myself like did i do that thing did i not do that thing sometimes the things are totally innocuous like you know um putting out the laundry or something like that like i had a dream that i put out the laundry and then i wake up and i go um oh i totally put out the laundry like later on in the day and then um i you know i go and check oh shit i actually didn't do that was that a dream i think i dreamed that i put that out and then i get totally confused and um kind of work it out slowly over time like oh shit i think i actually did dream that and uh now i need to actually put out the laundry something like that <laughs> yeah i've heard of other people having similar experiences to that i don't think you're alone in that i think a lot of people can kind of blur the lines between their dreams and reality which is also another fascinating subject because i mean who's to say that this isn't the dream world and that when we fall asleep we go back to our real selves in whatever dimension that is yeah well what if this is the lucid dream what if we're so convinced by this dream we can't wake up from it it's um interesting concept i think that lucid dream means that you can you can control things right like when i lose a dream i can control the way gravity works i can fly i can uh summon people into my dream i can uh change things in the dream i can change the location of the dream like i can move right. and 
you know, teleport and step through mirrors and stuff like that. Things that are um, impossible in the real world. Uh, but I don't know if there's that a, world's more real than this world. Another dimension somewhere else that you can actually do all of those things. But I, yeah. I don't. I don't imagine. I, I can't imagine what laws would be in place to actually allow for all of that to happen. I don't know. It's uh it's an interesting concept. Some some sort of like mind uh what um uh, like a a mind experiment or like a a thought experiment. It's interesting. Well even just the the postulation of what is it we're exactly doing when we're dreaming. We don't fully understand it. I mean it's a good it's a good like anchor to consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like maybe I think so. what we need to do if we want to understand consciousness is to understand dreaming first. I think you're onto something with that. I think that dreaming seems to provide some kind of like factory reset on the brain to allow it to like process things in such a way to, to maintain its healthy state while operating in the framework of this world i think that without it we'd go crazy maybe and that's the whole point is that we need that extra anchoring and grounding because otherwise we would go insane yeah it's, it's funny like even animals that um apparently like they don't seem to ever sleep have like the ability to put part of their brain to sleep um while yeah, another part of their brain something. yeah is uh is awake and like they Isn't cycle dolphins, between, dolphins do that i believe dolphins have they like, shut down one side of their brain yeah. at a time. Oh, wait, is it whales or dolphins or something, something like that? Something yeah. like that. Maybe both. They like uh, have like <laughs> a half half brain sleep, and they they cycle right. back and forth to to kind of give their brain that like rest time that it needs to. I don't know what it's doing. I don't think anybody understands fully what it's doing. Um, reconfirm software reality. Updates. Yeah, software updates. Like it's it, it is funny that basically if you don't sleep if you just stay awake for uh days and days eventually you'll become so disconnected with reality like you can't even tell like what's going on you're completely like, like discombobulated like you're seeing things you're uh, basically asleep <laughs> while you're awake right you're you're awake yeah. but things are passing through like a dream state um i could speak to this if you want i've i've had these experiences i've, I've I could speak a little bit on this if you'd like me to go into it. Okay, go on. I've had um, I've had really bad insomnia in the past, and I've also like had slightly crazy lifestyles of like you know happy to game like days and days and days without sleeping. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also went through I've been through like rough times where, say, I was consuming more weed than usual, and that was having like a compound effect with the lack of sleep and creating some very bizarre experiences. For example, at one point, I think I went almost a whole week without sleeping and uh, wasn't really eating much either. And like you say about like, it's like you're sleeping while you're awake. It was literally like that where my entire vision was obscured by like, it was almost like a porthole, a, a porthole or a portal was like opening up from the center of my vision and taking up like 80% of the vision. I could only see like the periphery of the room behind that. And it was like... I was looking at a dream while awake and it was like I was seeing myself in a car driving while laying down on a sofa. I could see the room around the, the, the image of the car driving, but I was I was seeing both at the same time, if that Ooh. makes sense, dreaming while awake. Wow. That's wild. Um yeah. that's that sounds like a really interesting movie, actually. <laughs> that's like uh oh. one of that's like one of those like uh into the void movies you know what have you ever seen into the void no it's a movie about um a guy in japan who uses dmt and then he gets he gets shot and killed um and it has like a really interesting um has very interesting visuals about dmt and a really interesting visual about like the the sort of afterlife and stuff like that it's kind of a wild movie uh, if you haven't seen it then you definitely gotta check it out into the void can't remember what year it, it is yeah. but um well, speaking of dmt methotriplamine mm -hmm. i really want to try that like if, if yeah. i could do anything before i die that's what i want to do before i die 
Like, well, <laughs> after I've done DMT, then it'll be like, ah, I'm going to be like a, a, a Protoss Corsair and be like, it's a good day to die every <laughs> single day. <laughs> I uh, I did DMT a few times and um, it was pretty mind boggling. Um, a roommate of mine back in college made it out of, uh, oh. he, he, at the time, I think it was like a, uh, it was actually legal to import the, the leaf, certain leaf right. from, uh, you know, South America or something like that. And, and he synthesized he, it out of it. Yeah, he he did it. He he, uh, you know, researched it online. He ordered the plants. The plants arrived. He synthesized it, um, and then made like a huge batch of it. And he, Lucky. yeah, he made it. Uh, it was it was pretty crazy, man. It's it's kind of like. Um, what you're talking about, like a portal opens up and you just kind of fall into it. Um, and then you're not even you anymore. Uh, right. you're just kind of like zooming through the galaxy as just a, a single Sign, yeah. point of consciousness that doesn't have any understanding of what a human being is. <laughs> yeah. This cosmonaut is ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's a very intense experience, but, um, really, um, like it's interesting in that movie, the into the into the void movie, that uh, the guy ends up dying, uh, and then has that like outside of body experience after death, um, because when I did the DMT trip, I re I, I felt like that is what it's like to die. I really had that sense of like this is this is what death feels like. And mm. then I didn't really feel like you said, like, oh, I'm not really afraid of it anymore. Like, I see, I see what you know. You can try to explain it to somebody, oh, or explain it to like a a young person, like, what is it like to die? And like, oh, well, you're just you don't know anything. You don't, you know, you're just kind of like disconnected from the world. Um, Sounds amazing. You're not you anymore. You're just uh, outside of um, your body you know um to what it's like to just be a soul do you know what i mean to just be like going a, back to the source or almost sort of yeah so it's it's like you you can explain that as being you know disconnection from the body but to actually experience it is um it's kind of freeing in a way because it's like oh well now i know what it's like it's not that bad because you know to to be uh, disconnected from the ego is very scary um but disconnection from the ego is i think the best correlation to what death is uh, mm. and and it really is not uh it's not as scary as it sounds and it was and, um, and, and i don't think any of our efforts here on earth can actually get us to that detachment of ego because i feel like almost detaching your ego is like the biggest ego trip going as well. It's like a bit of a paradox, right? Like the more enlightened you become, the more of an ego you'd probably have as well. So it's almost like a catch 22. It's, it's almost like you have to die to truly get it. But, but you can maybe through the use of these substances like methotriptamine or psilocybin kind of get the idea of what that death is like and yeah. kind of shuffle off that mortal coil temporarily to kind of get some idea of what that is behind the curtain. Yeah, it definitely helps you to alleviate like a bit of a fear of the of death. You know, that's what it did for me. It made me feel like uh, I had already died, and now I can just live. And um, <clears> that <throat> didn't fully sink in right away, but it it uh, took shape over time. It only took like I think two two or three trips to really like uh, you know settle into my my consciousness, but um. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like we talk about consciousness a lot this this podcast, but when I did DMT, it felt like I got to experience pure consciousness. Like, what is it like to mm. just be conscious without yeah, having nothing any, else, no interference? Yeah, nothing else exactly. That's kind of what I was trying to get at with you with that conversation I had, maybe a podcast about mm. the whole getting out of your own way thing it's almost like trying to attune to that state of consciousness while in that mortal form like that flow state almost right right yeah my biggest uh like my um i actually had a lot of time to think about this uh over the past week and um 
I think my big like gripe about what you were saying, like my kind of like pushback about it was that I feel like what um we were talking about I, honestly I don't think that it's that far off from uh what I what I was saying as well. Like we weren't we weren't I, too I far apart from each other. I like, agree. What I, I do agree with that. What I was saying was uh, very similar. Like you need to let go of uh, results basically the stoic principle of like you know focus purely upon efforts to um and let go of you know trying to get what you're what you're searching for you know and just right. uh, focus on being better and like and and just doing what what you need to do in order to uh you know to better yourself and then those those results will come and then um do you remember what my yeah. contention with that was? Right. Go on. Say it again. All right. So the, the contention was purely based on the framing because mm -hmm. I was basically trying to say, well, you have to be careful about that because if you come at it too much from the angle of I'm going to better myself by doing this, you have to realize that, well, hang on a minute. I'm not yet that better self. So maybe I don't know quite what's right for me right now i might do something that i think is good for me that might have a negative effect like, like similar to what you were saying earlier about like oh the great the two horses came but then they broke my leg and oh now i don't have to go to war you never quite know the, the influence of what these things might have on your life mm. be it good or bad and that's kind of the issue is like i'm coming at it from the angle of well i also feel like you need to let go of letting go it's almost like having that desire to not desire is still desiring that's the issue mm. well what i think my my like contention with the the sort of like letting go of um improving you know saying that you can't improve yourself is that uh most people and you know their their struggle is not what i think your pay what you, the the benefit of this this ideology uh, of like letting go of improving Everything. and like like getting out of your own way, I think is very beneficial to somebody who is already on their way. Do you know what I mean? Someone who's yeah, I agree with who's you. working no, I do on agree. themselves. Like, let's say for me, right? Like, I am always practicing brood war. Like, let me try to get out of my own way by like letting go of trying to improve something like that. You know, just like enjoying the experience or just kind of like letting things happen do you know what i mean like okay maybe that's a mm -hmm. way to improve that's a way to get better is to like let go of of uh you know trying to get better and then but the thing is like if i don't even show up to play then that's not gonna help me but, at all do you know what i mean but you, will, but you will show up to play it's just you won't be attached to the idea of the improvement itself so let's say you say you you say you're a stoic and you're good at letting go of the attachment to the outcome so okay you don't you don't win and maybe that's okay but the reality is you might feel inside that you didn't improve during that session mm. so then you might be frustrated because you're not achieving your goal of improvement your goal is to improve right mm -hmm. so you still have that attachment that will still cause suffering remember we talked about on the previous Previous episode about how attachment being the root of all suffering and now that's the problem is that you're still hung up on something you still have the outcome dependence it's just that you you're tricked yourself into not realizing it so you're still in no, that trap so, it's just that you've, you've got you've got a better framing you, you you're like you're like halfway there but not completely so the what i would say is that the stoic principle of like you wouldn't even be trying to improve or you wouldn't even be attached to the thought of improving what you would be is just focusing on my effort. So like, okay, I don't feel like I improved, but that's not inside my control. Improving or not improving is not inside my control. What's inside my control is just, am I working towards that improvement? So I would be able to feel good about like, yes, I put in those hours. Yes, I did do that study that like, I need to let go of the, the result mm. of improving. I'm sure you right? can 
I'm sure you can speak from your own personal experience. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but mm. I'm sure you've had your own frustrations of, say, regressing, where it's like, you mm. know, you, you derank and you lose your progress, or it seems like you lose your progress, and that causes frustration, right? Because that's like kind of the universe telegraphing to you that you have failed and your your fruits, your fruits there's no fruits of your labor. And I'm sure that even a Stoic is going to get frustrated with that, the same way a Zen Buddhist is going to get frustrated and angry just because he's a Zen Buddhist doesn't mean he doesn't get frustrated and angry. Well, I'm not. Um, I'm not a perfect Stoic. Perfect Stoic wouldn't wouldn't get frustrated with that because they would be happy with stoic their effort. Never, I also mm -hmm. think a perfect Stoic wouldn't have any connection to anyone or anything because he doesn't need anyone or anything. He's such a Stoic that he doesn't have attachment to anybody and he doesn't need anybody, so he wouldn't have the interactions with anybody. I don't know what you're saying, but. Um... I think a true Stoic, if mm -hmm. you embody the print, like a, I think there's a there's a bit of a fallacy going on there. I think, like, say, to use Star Wars, Star Wars as an analogy, like, say, the Jedi, like, they might, you could argue that they're they're fighting for the side of good or what have you, or like peace and whatever in the universe, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. but I think that the reality is that they're quite misguided as well, right? Just because they're fighting for what they think is justice doesn't necessarily mean they're going about it the right way. And I think, like, much like Stoicism, it only gets you so far i think it's a great line of principles and i think that it's if anything it's one of the most powerful philosophies you can adopt if you haven't adopted anything yet and i think if there's anyone out there that's trying to choose between zen buddhism and stoicism and you've got no experience of either i'd probably advise them to go with stoicism first so i actually kind of agree with you that it's actually a really good framework to follow and it's also a great stepping stone into like other states of consciousness and it i think it's beneficial for everyone to learn all about it that's basically what I'm saying. I think it's great. However, I also think that if you go too far down that line, I think you, there's, there's got to be a threshold because if you're so detached from everything, then you have no need for experience. And if you have no need for experience, you have no need for learning. And if you have no need for learning, then you're not improved. And I don't know, it's kind of it's kind of a bit of a paradox. I feel like there needs to be some kind of balance balance going on there. I don't understand what you're saying, but... Um... Like that's what I that was my grip with what you were saying was that you um you I'm not don't need to in terms of you need to let go, go of ever improving because you're not capable of improving yourself is like well then you're so detached from your own like efforts that you're not gonna even try do you know what I mean like you just just let go of trying it's not it's not that you don't it's not that you don't try though it's not it's not that you you seem to be coming from the lens of like you just don't play the game anymore if anything i think you would be more likely to do that if you were a true stoic you wouldn't have the need to play the game because you'd be attached to the game or the the need to improve at the game i think if you were embodying that philosophy a hundred percent without any human element in there but i think since there is still a human element in there and the ego is still in there that that doesn't happen you still have that attachment to the rate of improvement what have you um and I guess what I'm trying to say is with, with the the alignment of trying to let go, it's not that you're not playing the game. If anything, you're playing the game more because you're not getting frustrated at the game. So you're able to like open up to the idea of, you know, winning or losing whatever, how many games in a row, maybe you lose 10 in a row, win 10 in a row, who knows, but you're detached from that outcome. So it enables you to play for longer, if anything. And maybe you, you'd realize that because you're also not so rigid in how you're practicing say you're trying to practice a very specific build or in a very specific way but it's making you play so rigid that your opponent is abusing you too much and it's creating negative interactions in the game and because you're so focused on doing a certain thing in a certain way it's limiting your interactions in the game so you're not actually improving as a player because one of the ways you can dominate an opponent in starcraft is by forcing interactions and that's how a pro gamer is going to dominate an amateur player is he's going to force so many interactions that the other player won't be able to keep up he won't be able to execute his build order and his strategy while also keeping up with the interactions that the other player is forcing him into so i feel like as a gamer you do have to kind of have a sense of flow state and be able to force these interactions and not be too rigid in how you're trying to practice it's great to have deliberate practice and focus on certain elements of your game like just focus on the build order or just the macro but not for too long because otherwise you're not going to develop all these other skills that are going to be necessary and if you try and limit yourself too much by you know simplifying your learning experience and trying to control everything 
you're really going to limit your actual potential growth overall. And by getting out of your own way, you open up all those realms of possibilities. And it's suddenly like, think of all the par- the parallel universes of the potential, say, in StarCraft player. And in one universe, you're an A rank. In one universe, you're a B rank. In one universe, you're an S rank, but only you cheese. In another, another universe, you got there an S rank, but you only did macro builds or whatever, what have you. And maybe just by letting go of that that control and attachment you have all those op- opportunities accessible to you and maybe in now in this universe you can become an a rank that's really good at cheesing or an a rank that's really good at macro builds because you got out of your own way to even give yourself the possibility to discover that yeah i just i don't see how that's um that's that's like gonna help me to get to what i want to do <laughs> i just i don't understand okay, like okay okay well in the context of you if you want me to be, uh-huh. be less general and speak more just personal to you okay saying i would say analyze your recent place not recent recent but fairly recent play sessions of your frustrations and when you were like dropping rank or what have you and and look at how despite your best efforts of like maintaining your stoicism and having all the best intentions and what have you it still like kind of went down the drain a little bit and you weren't able to keep your composure to actually gain too much benefit from those sessions but when you went and take a break and you went and just did your own thing play some other games play some rim world do some of this do some of that and then come back to the game and having a more relaxed attitude about it you seem to like maybe discover new ways of learning and having a more open mind to the game and able maybe to absorb information better because you got out of that trap out of that feedback loop mm. Yeah, like um, just some extra, um, you get like a, a fatigue for the game for sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's because that fatigue stems from that conscious control is what I'm trying to say to you. Because if you had less attachment, you would be draining yourself less. Mm-hmm. If, you, if, if you weren't trying to, you know, if, if, you, if you think of it as like, it, think of like a fighter jet, like they're so modern now that they're basically like mo- mobile command centers. You could still use it to dogfight and you could still take the controls and fly it very manually. But for the most part, you could just push buttons and let it do its own thing, right? And that's kind of like what I'm talking about. Like, try and use your body and mind more like a command post rather than like you're a dogfighting pilot trying to micromanage everything. Same. Mm. So I think this has some, some, maybe some benefit to someone who's really like trying to become good at something, right? You're like working hard towards becoming great at StarCraft. You're working hard to become, to be good at, uh, I don't know. Um, accounting or something i don't know what you're trying to uh, become fantastic at um maybe you know this sort of talk this sort of like um ideology might be helpful to somebody who's really putting in the hours and you know they need a they need a rest they need a break they need like a a, a burst of inspiration or something like that to to push past whatever barrier they've come up against but to someone who is not doing the things that they need to do to improve their life, like they're not even started yet. I feel like the laissez-faire approach of that sort of Zen Buddhist, like you cannot improve yourself, so stop trying to improve yourself. I th- feel like that is like a demotivator that's not going to make you, like let's say you're thinking about starting a YouTube channel, you're starting to put out videos or you're thinking of starting a podcast or you're thinking of uh you know uh going to the gym working out or like you're thinking of doing something and you've been thinking about at it for a long long time because you know that you should do it or you you feel like it would make your life better but you're just not doing it because you're not um you're not motivated to do it. you don't have the discipline to get it done and then you know you have this this sort of uh, ideology come into your life where it's like oh just you're not you're not 
capable of improving yourself, then I don't think that that's, that's going to help people to, um, to actually get on that path you know what i mean i feel like the the stoic approach Maybe or like the, the the stoic approach of like take control of what is within your control you know what i mean like let's get moving on the things that are actually uh you know within our realm uh, rather than outside of ourselves is gonna get more people to begin the path of improvement um better than you know the ideology of like oh you can't improve you're not able to improve that's that's where i was like coming from when i was like th this is this is a very deep concept what you're talking about and i i see yeah. that you've thought about it a lot but when i hear what you're saying i i i don't feel like that's going to help a lot of people um to get started on what cuz most people just haven't even started on what they maybe want to get done like if they're thinking of starting to produce videos or something like that and they have an idea for it um they they need something more like concrete they need they need something um that's going to help them to get to get to that start line you know what i mean to actually get well, they, they do rolling. they do because they tell them they do they tell themselves that they need some things therefore they need it they're manifesting that well they right? need so it the they need it because they haven't right. they haven't started i, I agree <laughs> i agree and as i was and as i was saying earlier I, I, if, if anyone hadn't had any pre-knowledge of what these ideologies or what these belief structures are what have mm -hmm. you i reckon i would i would recommend stoicism over zen buddhism and i think that even if you wanted to become a zen buddhist maybe you should use stoicism as a stepping stone you know mm -hmm. what i mean as your gateway drug so to speak i think like it, yeah i think it gives you the tools necessary to start to understand things better i, I think it's amazing and I, I even though i'm a zen buddhist i still practice stoicism if that mm -hmm. makes sense i, I don't poo poo stoicism i think it's amazing and we need to um we need to uh yeah respect those different thoughts those different uh, angles of uh, approaching living but i really do feel like um it's important to me that uh my friends do well and i want i want to see them do well so when you were talking about yeah. it i was just coming at it from like I want to see you do well, so I don't. I don't like that idea. If it's, if it's something well, that's gonna give you, you an, an idea to or <laughs> give you, give you an excuse to just not. Uh, what if I get what going, if I told you, know? you that the opposite was true, and that mm. the only reason I have motivation to even be doing this podcast right now is because of that? Because I tried doing it. Me personally, I did. I did do a stoic angle, and it was successful, but honestly also gave me more anxieties in certain regards as well like it wasn't a perfect structure for me for me obviously for other people it might be great mm. um but with zen buddhism uh yeah it kind of the opposite happens like because i'm i i have i have my sister like call me up and just like trauma dump onto me like the most horrific day she's had sometimes and like if I like a few years ago, before I was like more embodying this belief structure, I, 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 I've been studying Zen for a very long time, but I certainly wasn't a very adept pr practitioner of it until maybe more recently. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be modest there, I genuinely think that, but in more recent times, I've been able to more embody those beliefs rather than just thinking and believing them. And uh, honestly, it's been able to help me deal with the most traumatic stuff that. I, I, my father's death, for example, um, was very sudden and brutal. Yet, through Zen Buddhism and Stoicism, was able to like deal with that effortlessly. Mm -hmm. Relatively speaking, obviously, it was <laughs> broken brutal. I just mean that I thought I would be able, not able to, to even function. I thought I'd be like so devastated that I can't even think straight. But the reverse was true. I felt like more competent than I'd ever been in my life. And in fact, John, it, something John Pearson said actually resonated with me. In those moments, um, I thought back to something he had said, and he said, uh, "One thing you can like aim to achieve in life is to be the strongest person at your parents' funeral." Mm. And I and I was that, and I, I stood up and I, I gave a, a speech, and I even made like people laugh at my dad's funeral, mm. and like I wanted to lift the spirits of people there, and I, I felt like I wouldn't be able to do that without Stoicism or Zen Buddhism, mm. and I can only speak from personal experience. Right, right. Uh, we were talking about a little bit about that. Like, uh, I remember, 
um, last time we talked about how you were in a taxi uh, leaving the hospital and you yeah. you talked about how you you kind of said like sort of like a mis uh, a mistruth you know you just said to the mm -hmm. guy like you know my dad's fine or whatever and uh, you were asking me about like you know about telling the truth in that moment and right. you know I, I gave kind of a response but um I, I thought about it a lot more afterwards and I was saying I was thinking about it like um it is kind of like I, I don't want to uh say anything you know mean to you but I feel like it's a it's kind of a uh self-serving lie right just like most lies are self-serving is that you didn't want an awkward interaction and oh, I'm comfortable align. with the awkward interaction. Mm. The, 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 th the thing was, was that he seemed like a very, um, how to put it, he seemed very surface level in how he was interfacing with the world. And he didn't seem like he would want to go into anything too deep mm. yet. And I, I didn't, I didn't offer the information. Oh, my dad's fine. It's just that he offered it in like a, Oh, well, I hope he gets better kind of thing. And I was just like going along with that being like, yeah, me too. Kind of thing. I, mm. I didn't want to, I felt like in that moment I could handle the awkwardness. I could handle the, and I could handle the emotion of dealing with my dad dying better than he could handle the awkwardness of not knowing what to say when someone says, Oh, by the way, my dad's dying. Actually. Like I just, yeah, I don't want to ruin his day, man. I'll make him feel bad or something. Mm. It, in a way, it was it was me just wanting to. I felt like I could be strong for both of us in that situation, and I was, that's what I was doing. I was coming from a place of strength. I was inside, still vulnerable because I'm going through the process of dealing with my dad's death and what have you. But at the same time, I felt like I was more resilient than I'd ever been before, and I felt like I had this almost like awakening inside myself. And I was like, "Hang on a minute, I don't need to obsess and be so anxious about anything anymore." I can just deal with it in the moment and right. like handle each 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 moment as they come and like only worry about the now. So you don't think that he might have had somebody who died as well? Like maybe he would have, you know, if you well, told getting, him you know, I, that well, he, I was getting out. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> maybe he would have had a, a a story for you. Like, right. well, my wife just died, you know, six months ago, and you guys could maybe talk about that a little bit and that would have helped you in that situation. Right. Maybe you would have had a really great interaction with that guy. Like I, I, something I, it, would have helped. I, I, you. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. There, there's possible something. We, I, I maybe robbed him or at the very least I could have robbed him of having a, a connection and maybe mm -hmm. a good interaction that maybe he needed. That's the way you probably want to attack me with say, hang on a minute, John, he could have had like someone that died and he, hasn't been able to like find someone else that's going through the same thing right now. For all I know, maybe his mom died of pancreatic cancer as well. And he'd be, he'd find it cathartic to find someone to relate to. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely right. That is, that is a poss possibility, but in the moment in my authentic self, he had just pulled up and I was in the process of getting out of the car when he said it. And mm -hmm. it was like, I didn't want to make it super awkward for him as I was getting out of the car kind of thing. It was like a, you know, if I maybe if I wasn't in the process of getting out of the car, maybe it'd been different. But in that moment, it just felt right to do that. Mm. Yeah, and you could also have just said, uh, you know, thank you. <laughs> you don't have to. Um, there, there's, yeah. there's like, there's, there's really no reason to lie. I think in most circumstances, especially with the stranger, like the, like I told you before, my only reasons to ever lie is to keep someone secret and to, um. To, to not go to jail or right? to to lie to the police. So yeah. like there's there are some circumstances to lie, but I feel like every interaction is better um and more authentic if you uh if you choose not to lie. But that was just something that I thought about after that conversation. And um yeah I thought I'd bring it up again. But um it's uh it 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 is tough. It is tough to in every situation to just say the truth uh even if it seems like kind of like a very passing moment you know what i mean that doesn't really matter yeah. someone who will never maybe you'll never see them again or you'll never have the interaction with them again um and right. just to like smooth over a conversation or to smooth out an interaction uh with just a quick 
um, an easy lie that just uh, doesn't have any effect on the real world, doesn't have any effect on them at all. But I feel yeah. like and every time you do those type of things, it it kind of like primes your brain to pull a lie. You know what I mean? When you have any sort of situation, you know what I mean? Whereas if you're right. constantly always just saying the truth or, uh, you know, avoiding lying, at least like never lying. That's what Jordan Peterson says, right? Like at, uh, tell the truth or at least don't lie. It's like, um, to the best of your knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, you don't have to tell the truth all the time, but you can, you can avoid telling the truth, but not by telling a lie. Do you know what I mean? But I don't know if I agree fully with that. Cause I also mm. think that omission of truth is also lying in different packaging. Like mm. for example, if you don't tell your spouse, you cheated on them. That's, that's an omission of, of truth and you're still lying by not telling them. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a, a difficult situation. Like, right. Um, how did you get away with lying or with uh, cheating, right? Did you lie to them, tell them that you were going on a business trip when you were actually, you know, going to meet up with a woman? Like, how did you, how did you just, uh, <laughs> how did you get away with uh, cheating on someone without l ever lying to them? You know what I mean? It's pretty tough. Um, and just, but yeah, I think, but I think even if you don't tell a lot, even if you somehow are, are, are god at like loopholes and you figure mm -hmm. out a way of skirting around that, I think you're still lying because you're omitting the truth. Still, that's mm -hmm. still a form of lying. Mm -hmm. Sure, I think it's just semantics. Sure. Like the, the, that's just a liar's way of justifying it to themselves. It's very, uh, very hard to to pull off something like that. But yeah, um, eventually you're gonna have to lie if you're you're going around behind your your partner's back um that would be uh that would be a very specific situation huh there's something you're actively doing especially like it's one thing to like do it one time and never do it again and mm. like don't tell them that one truth but to actively live the false truth and mm -hmm. omit the real truth that's like deep lying yeah for sure you're literally living a lie right but for example you know um someone asks you like how are you doing today? And you're actually just completely destroyed. Um, but you don't want to have that conversation with them. Uh, if, do you say, what if, what about, you know, you, 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 you could tell them like, uh, I'm doing, you know, I'm not doing so well, but, uh, change the subject. You know what I mean? Like, what if you just change the uh -huh. subject? Like you just go, um, all, all is clear on the Western front or something like that. You know what I mean? Like things are going well at work something like that you know what i mean you just don't mm -hmm. tell them that you are um you are you know falling apart you know but um if you tell them directly i'm doing great how are you that's a lie that is i would say um negatively going to impact you uh in the future do you know what i mean that's like that Telling people that you're doing great when you're actually falling apart is, uh, it's like priming your own mind for future lies. And it's also, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really bad for your mental health. I think that's one thing that people do a lot that I think is really, mm. really bad for your mental health is going around when things are falling apart, telling everyone that everything's fine. Because you're kind of, yeah. you're lying to yourself at, while you're lying to everyone else. And then you don't really know when everything is fine, when everything's great. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you, yeah. when, when things are actually great, you're, you're still acting the same way as when things were falling apart. So your body is like, your body gets confused. I feel like your mind gets confused. Um, it's as almost like where you're, you're forcing actually yourself at. into a state of cognitive dissonance, which right. is usually like ushered in from like a toxic relationship, except the toxic relationship is with yourself. Mm -hmm. Cognitive dissonance is a good way to put it. Like you have a weird cognitive dissonance in how you're actually feeling, how you're actually doing, you know? Um, you're literally mm -hmm. invalidating yourself. You're literally gaslighting yourself and validating your own emotion. You're literally yeah. basically being an abuser to yourself. Like the, the same thing, like say a toxic boyfriend or girlfriend would do to you, but you're doing that to yourself. Like it's really bad. Yeah. So like, um, 
if you're in that situation, someone asks you, are you okay? Are you doing okay? And you just tell them like, no, I'm not doing all right, but I don't really want to talk about it. Like, okay, that's, that's, I'll tell them that's exactly. fine. Me, me, you know? me personally, I mm. tell them more or less what's going on, but I wouldn't trauma dump onto someone mm. like right away. I'd kind of like give them a vibe of what it is and then see if kind of gauge their reaction of like, do they actually want me to get into this or not? Mm. And, and sometimes that'll, that'll be through the form of them telling me some trauma as well. If, if they're willing to share their trauma, maybe they're much more likely to to hear mine. You know what I mean? Or at least be willing to talk on that level. Right. But I'm I'm thinking of the situation where you just, you don't want to talk to that person. You know what I mean? You don't want to give them that information. Well, you just well, want to move on Everyone's from a... that conversation. Like you want to keep oh. going forward because you're not, you're not ready to talk about that. You know what I mean? Like you you don't want to talk about that with that person. So you you would just lie, just say like, no, I'm doing fine, but that's that's not good for your mental state. Just say like, no, I don't want to, you know, I'm I'm not doing well, but I I'm sorry, I don't want to talk about it, and just move on. And like that person has to accept that they can't force you to say anything about it, but at least they know that you're not doing well, and maybe they can give you like a little bit of a wider berth. You know what I mean? They can give you a little bit more of a uh, you know, some more space or whatever, and you can also uh be truthful with yourself do you know what i mean you right. can you can maintain that truth internally and externally i think that would definitely be beneficial in a, a lot of dynamics it also could have a detrimental effect like say you're dealing with someone that has um rejection sensitivity they might see that as uh, you rejecting them if mm. you do say something like that especially if they right. especially if you're not very careful with your tone of voice when you say it some people i'm not trying to say people are like snowflakes i'm saying literally they've got like mental illnesses which makes them more sensitive to these things and they might you know mis mis misunderstand your intention and, be and think that you're in a way rejecting them and don't want to share with them specifically specifically right well you can't walk on eggshells all the time like hoping that they're not going to uh you know blow up on you or something you have to you have to live your own authentic truth right <laughs> definitely definitely <clears throat> and maybe you maybe you can be a little bit softer with your tone or your language and how you do it but i think the the key still remains is the lot like not lying in uh for for convenience sake is really important to to keeping your own mental uh you know count on what is true and what's not well i, I feel like we we talked about this on a previous episode about how the lies we tell are like the most damaging and i think i even brought up we tell ourselves yeah yeah and i think i think that we are but like you say we're, we're painting over rotten wood if we if we don't be honest with ourselves and that blinds you to the rotten wood beneath and that will come crashing down eventually if, if you remain blind to it and um, i think there will be many more issues going forward in society because it seems like there is some kind of mental health epidemic going on right now i think so yeah i mean i think it comes back around to the the whole like um thing we were talking about with diet right deficiencies right. in, in uh, your nutrition I think causes a lot of mental health issues and deficiencies in your mother's nutrition during your gestation as well I think causes a lot of health issues there's so many factors that are happening that are going on with, with health and with um, your maturation like as a fetus uh, there's it's right. it's really hard for us to pin down anything it's like another thing that we you know we don't understand consciousness but we really don't understand health as of like for the the full thing do you know what i mean like everything together uh every single day there's so many new studies and information coming out about health that's just well, kind of doctors are so eyes, specialized yeah. it's kind of hard to know everything about how everything works there's mm -hmm. just so much to to learn so, and, and, and as science progresses it's like the like two-thirds of what you learn a few years ago is going to become irrelevant and thrown out the window because it's going to be wrong or something you know mm -hmm. so understanding our own bodies is very uh new science very like progressive progressively like uh what what would you say like it's cutting edge science you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, there, there yeah. are definitely things that uh, 
are clear is that eating foods that deplete your nutrients is going to be bad for you in the long run, whether that's for all kinds of illnesses or disorders, mental or, uh, you know, organ failures, those type of things, heart failures, the, the amount of yeah. heart disease that we're seeing now, I think a lot of that can be attributed to these products, these processed products that are shoved into every single thing, processed sugars and uh, vegetable oils. And there's no escaping it because even if you're a vegan, you're probably eating some of the most processed food available to you out there. So there's a oh, lot yeah. of people out there thinking that they're they're doing all right and they're you know they're vegans and they're going about their day and then they're, they're doing some good in the world and they're doing their body some good, but they might be eating some ultra processed foods that are going to really be messing them up as well. Yeah, the uh, my wife worked in a vegan restaurant when uh, she was in Nagoya. Um, for like a year or something like that. And uh, she she was saying like some of the most disgusting food stuff she's ever seen was in that vegan restaurant. Like the way that they were processing certain things um, and the way they were making foods in the vegan restaurant was repulsive to her. Like it w w really put her off of veganism because she was a vegan for several years, right. but she ended up turning off of it because of what she saw. Like the 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 processes that they were using to make the foods was really repulsive to her to where she she won't even eat vegan food anymore. She's like, no, I'm not I'm not interested in vegan food at all. So right. um yeah, that that's definitely true, I think. And um just eating like very clean food that your ancestors would have eaten, you know. Um meats potatoes of vegetables uh you know but use butter use olive oil oils that are natural um like for example an olive all you have to do is squeeze it and you get olive oil right it's not like there's a chemical process to get olive uh, oil out of olives it's very simple um these other seed oils like canola oil they're not just crushing it to get the oil. You know what I mean? Like there's a, a huge list of processes that needs to be done right. to get oil out of that seed. So all of these seed oils are very, very highly processed. And we know that processed uh, food is, is rough for you, but it's just used in every vegan, every vegan food. There's so many, yeah. So many I think you should be careful oils. about where, where you purchase your oil as well, because mm. I think there's some deceptive marketing going on where, say, it could be olive oil mixed with another oil mm. and being marketed as olive oil, because there's only a threshold they need to meet depending on what the labels are actually saying. So you kind of want to probably want to actually look on the back of those bowls and do a little bit of investigation before you purchase as well. Right. Just use just use butter, butter and beef tallow um, or or lard is fine. Those are those are natural fats. <clears throat> that are um readily available you can get them very cheap um the only reason that vegetable oil became so popular i think is because it's even cheaper than those oils but you don't really need a lot um to cook with uh butter or beef tallow you just uh put a small amount we, in and you can we, cook. we could also add a tiny bit of oil to the butter just to help it stop burning as well would be another little trick you could do so using a tiny bit of oil and little bit of butter and you're also stopping the butter from reaching a burning threshold as well I'm, am i wrong about this i think that butter has a higher smoke point than olive oil but i'm not sure i've heard i don't know for sure i don't know but I think i'm butter pretty has sure a very high smoke point but i'm i'm not 100 percent no that. i think i think it's the other way around i think by adding the oil to the butter you prevent it reaching that smoke point At least that's what I've heard chefs say, how right that is. Who knows? Sains, like Googling dashing it. his fingers across the keyboard like a spider right now, trying to investigate <laughs> the smoke point of uh, butter and oil. We need, we need like a, we need a Jamie in the studio, you know, someone to look this shit up so we can go, hey, look that shit up. <laughs> mm, it, yeah, olive oil is 200 degrees. And uh, butter is 150. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little dash of oil with your butter to stop it from burning. 
It's a good little chef tip for you guys. Mm-hmm. I do that when I'm cooking my steaks because I want to be able to baste the steaks with the butter still, but I also don't want to burn the shit out of the steak and the butter. Mm. Do you take a uh, multivitamin at all? I mean, I do, but not for the purposes of the multivitamin because it doesn't really like, I, your body can only absorb so much. You know what I mean? But I take it for the fact the omega-3, it's like an omega-3 and it has a multivitamin with the omega-3, but I'm mainly taking it for like the, the fish oil and omega-3 and it just happens to have some other multivitamins. I also take a vitamin D supplement as well, mm. just for days that I'm not getting out as much. Right. Do you know that uh, redhead people make their own vitamin D? Well, <laughs> maybe the, maybe on the stat sheets they like untick soul and like added in the vitamin D <laughs> immunity. You know? Yeah, attributes. Yeah, they re- redistributed their attributes a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I I do take a multivitamin, but uh, I'm not totally sold on whether it's actually helping nah, or not. I mean, maybe there's some benefit, but I doubt my body's absorbing much of it. Maybe a little bit. I doubt it's doing as much for me as much as they're trying to market it to me as, you know what I'm mm-hmm, saying? Mm-hmm. I'm probably just buying expensive urine at the end of the day, but, <laughs> but there's some Omega-3 in there as well. So, you know what I mean? I'm getting a little bit out of it. Mm-hmm. Right. You could just eat fish. Eating fish is good too. I could just eat fish. You're right. I, I've, I've had so much fish and chips in, in my, my day that I'm a little bit put off fish. There are times I, I do like fish, but it's not something I could eat regularly. I see. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, much more likely to order an Indian than get fish and chips. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's um really common in Japan to eat a lot of fish, so I've been eating a ton. Mm. We got access to good fish for a start. Mm-hmm. A lot of fish, but um, I I think that and people know how to prepare it properly. <laughs> like J- Japan historically has had like really high um, really high. Uh, longevity you know people live a lot longer here than in a lot of places uh, in the west Mm. and um i I don't know i think that that might be slowly reversing like the issuance or the amount of um cancer is getting really crazy in japan and i think it might have to do with plastic like how much plastic is being used because i see it everywhere like if there's plastic. Individually wrapped stuff. Everything's wrapping, individually wrapped. Yeah, everything's covered in plastic. And um, it's really, really common here to have, like they have very nice meals in the convenience stores. You can just go in and get a, a little meal and uh, they will, like you take it out of the fridge, it's in plastic, and then they throw it in the microwave and microwave the shit out of it and then give it to you. So like one thing that's been brought up a lot recently is that microwaving plastic microwaving your food in plastic uh has like a really detrimental effect like the plastic like leaches chemicals into mm-hmm. your food and I, I i see it all the time like everyone's doing it here in japan it's really really common just wondering how much of an effect that's having i mean yeah, it's hard to say like, the exact impact, but I know for sure that we're not probably meant to have microplastics in our system. That's for damn sure. Yeah. And um, things like PFAS and stuff like that, the forever chemicals that are being used all the time, there's, there's, um, yeah, there's a lot to worry about in terms of... Uh, like that that's one thing it's like okay you can worry about the environment a lot but actually worrying about what goes into your body uh is probably more it's more beneficial to you it's like mm. we're thinking about the things that you can control but then at the same time if everybody's worrying about the things that are going into their body then the world will change do you know what i'm you know what i mean so like there there's like this this idea of like I need to go out and uh or I need to get on Twitter and like get really mad about certain things uh so that the world will change. Well, actually you need to like if you just act uh in a you know a way that's going to uh benefit you, you know, if you're actually just focused on the things that you can control, you're actually sort of controlling the things outside of yourself as well in a small way. Do you know what I mean? Um, rather than like trying to control things outside of you, 
uh, in a big way yeah. and then not controlling the things that are actually like you're actually getting nothing done if you're trying to control those big issues right, right? but if you're controlling by- at a small level then you're actually having a small effect you know what I mean? It, go, it goes back to the previous episode of the, the homelessness situation I talked about with mm. the people should be focusing on a more local level. Like instead of going on uh, X and uh, typing about how homelessness is so bad and blah, 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 and mm. you don't really do anything about the problem. It's, it, it's when you go down to the local homeless shelter and actually do something about it. You know what I mean? Like actually doing something you can have an impact on. If your goal is to actually have an impact and make a change, then why not do something on a more local level? If you do want to have a sense of control, if that's what you're really seeking is a sense of control over that situation, rather than right. focusing on the, the macro lens, focus on the more micro local lens. Right. And if you're really upset about the food system and like, um, you know, animals being treated badly, uh, they're not saying- why don't, huh? They're not, they're virtue signaling, or at least the vast majority of people are virtue signaling. They don't right. actually want to affect these issues. They just want to be seen to. It's, it's all like a social status thing. They're not, they've got anything else going on in their lives. So sure. it's like, oh, well, I can maybe get involved in this and have some kind of attention drawn from this and seem more interesting because I can talk about this. So if you're actually really upset about the food system, you're actually upset about animal cruelty, like starting your, starting your own garden, you know, doing like hydroponics or doing some sort of like, home gardening uh, and feeding yourself that way will actually that will have more of an effect than your like outrage will ever have right because if you're doing yeah. that and people pick up on like maybe other people start to notice what you're doing and maybe they start to do it too or even just you yourself doing it you're Be you're removing change. you're re- you're removing one more source of income for the uh for for the system you know what i mean and the system has to adapt um in order to survive um but it doesn't have to adapt if you don't change right if you don't change then it it can't it won't yeah. change right you have to be the change you want to see guys as simple as that stop harping on about it stop whining like like arnold schwarzenegger says stop whining yeah actually get out there and do something about it for god's sake go study some stoicism learn how to take some actual control of your life and don't rather than just sitting there talking about it. Don't do something like go out and have like a you know, a one day of protest or like rioting or something like that. That's not helping anything. Focus on your own life, what you can yeah. do to change your own life <clears throat> that especially will if you're benefit taking you. pictures of you. Especially if you're taking pictures of yourself at the protest to show people that you went to a protest. Like what 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 are you doing here? Like what's your intention behind this? Right. This is um it's a new world. It's a new world, uh, full of a lot of idiots. We've gotta, we've gotta slug on and just take care of ourselves, and try to, uh, try to be the change that we want to see. Yeah, try to act locally about what we feel should That's be different. That's what we're doing now with the podcast, right? Uh, we're acting locally within our community, our tribe, so to speak, and we've mm-hmm. got our own individuality within that tribe. That's what Jordan Peterson says, right? He says, like, you find a tribe to be a part of and you find your own individual identity once you've established yourself within that tribe. We've mm-hmm. already done that. We're old enough to have already done that. But now it's like maybe we can spread a little bit of not wisdom but you know a little bit of interesting topics within those communities to actually get people thinking and talking on a more local level and maybe that will have a more you know outward reach effect and it trickles down through like you know the hierarchies of society so to speak okay let's can i can i change the topic here for a second because i actually want to discuss one thing um that just has been like rattling in my brain for quite a long time, uh, sure, which is actually one thing that uh, Jordan Peterson said, and he was talking about like how uh, when you're going to climb a mountain, you should l- see if it's actually the mountain that you want to climb first. Like if you're going to take on an endeavor, if you're going to try yeah. to become something or get somewhere, you should actually look at that thing before you know where that actually is before you start that endeavor because you can get like really wrapped up in the journey and really wrapped up in like the efforts put in to get to that place and and then you end up at the top and you're like oh actually like once you're at the top of the mountain then you can see another mountain over in the distance like actually i I wanted to be over there i don't want to be here you know what i mean whereas when you're climbing the mountain you can't see the peaks 
you and then know you gotta mean? then you gotta go down the mountain to even begin to go you, up, you can't yeah. even just start climbing the next mountain it's like learning bad habits in starcraft yeah. or something it's like you finally see where you gotta be but you still gotta unlearn all those bad behaviors first before you can even start to actually improve right yeah so it's like if you're gunning to be the ceo of a company or whatever you should like go and see what that ceo's life is like you know what kind of hours are they working? You know, what kind of situation is their life in? You know, their relationships, their struggles, right? And like get to know because if that's what you're aiming for, um, it might seem impossible. It might seem impossible to get there, right? It might feel like you're you may never get there, but you might actually get there and you might actually arrive and realize that what you've been working for so long and hard is actually not even worth what you what you put in right so and it's not not mm. even where you want to be um so that's something that i've been thinking about a lot and i'm you know i'm doing this like youtube thing and like uh looking at other people who are doing it as well and going like is this something is this a mountain i really want to climb i think so but like um you know where am i going to be at the top if if i get to the top if i work really hard if i actually get success Am I gonna be where I actually want to be? You know what I mean. I I don't think people think about that. Soon? Isn't I don't think people think about that very much. Where do you want to be soon? Well, I mean, I have an idea. I have I have a a direction. You know, I want to be uh, independent, completely. The very best, like no one ever was. <laughs> you know, I want to um, be able to travel wherever I want and work from wherever I want. Um, and have enough money to just sustain myself, you know, and to, to have enough so that I can potentially have a family in the future if I want one. I haven't decided yet if I want kids, but like, I don't want it to be like, oh, I can't afford it. You know what I mean? I'd love to, I'd, right. I'd like to have the ability you to want do to that. Do, but you want to do that through very specific means. You want to do yeah. it facil facilitated by the things you enjoy. Exactly. Exactly. So that's my goal. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of uh, examples out there of people who have done it through making content on YouTube and on other platforms, that type of thing. You know, like one person who really comes to mind is like an, an artosis or a tasteless or something like that. Someone who mm. has been doing casting and everything for so long and they've reached that level of success and they have the ability to do those things, right? And it's interesting to look at them and go like, is that where I would like to be? Is that if I actually got to that level, would I be happy? You know what I mean? Um, they seem relatively happy. They seem pretty happy, but I just uh, do you know what would be amazing, saying? Yeah. Do you know what I want? Do you know what I want, saying? Yeah. Do you care? Go ahead. <laughs> Let me know. What I want is in about a year's time, mm. when maybe our podcast is slightly more interesting and slightly more viewed, I'd love to have tasteless and artosis on the podcast and do a deep dive on them and do like an interview like a, 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 like a double date you and me interviewing both of them and maybe they can flip the roles on us as well and ask us questions or like you know flip the script on us a little bit too if they want to shoot back a little bit and not have the spotlight on them too much you know what i mean but i would love to do a deep dive with them if possible in the future where we like interview both of them and go into their character and as ca as casters and their experiences and who they are as people and what have you. So is that the peak of the mountain or is that a step along the, the path to the peak? No, that's just that, that that's like the first peak of the mountain, then you realize the mountain keeps on going. <laughs> okay. And you're like Sisyphus learning to enjoy the process and only enjoy the process and it's okay to keep pushing that boulder up there up the mountain because that's what you want to do. Mm. Yeah. It, it's uh it's an interesting concept. That's it's just something that I've been thinking about a lot. Like um what does the peak of the mountain look like in the, the my chosen endeavor? You know what I mean? Like what what does it look like from up there? I'm just curious. I'm I'm wondering what it what it must be like and wondering whether that's gonna make me feel um you know, fulfilled or happy when I get to that peak. Is that gonna be the place where I'm like, Oh, I wish I would have climbed a different mountain, you know, or am I just gonna be Mm. happy being at the top um even if i ever get to the top of course i could die tomorrow i could you know fail and fall off and not make it but 
if I do keep pushing and I intend to keep pushing and I do eventually reach the top, like what is, what does it look like up there? Is that, is that well, where I want to go or should I change, should I change paths now so that I don't climb a mountain that I'm not interested in? You know what I mean? It's uh it's very, a very deep thought process. I don't think a lot of people think about it. And I think a lot of people just show up to work, work really hard um, and never think about like, well, maybe 10 years down the line, I'll be at this spot, you know, where I'm actually at the top of the mountain and like wonder, was this well, the right mountain to climb? I think the biggest tragedy in all of this is actually something a little bit different. I think the real tragedy is that they're never living in the moment. They're always living with, with the future in mind. They're mm. living in the now for the future and they're, they're losing the now. And then when they finally get to their destination, they've, they've lost all that now. And now they, they're in the new now and they're like, well, now what? Mm. It's like, well, this is it. This is, this is now. They're like, what? Is this it? This is what I've been working towards? Yes, this is now. You just, you've been ignoring it the entire time. Mm. You've been like not enjoying the process the entire time. You've been too obsessing over f the future. Right. That you weren't able to live in the now. Yeah, it's, it, there's like a balance between uh, thinking about the future and being in the now, right? Like you want to aim yourself at the right mountaintop. So you have to think about the future, but you also have to enjoy the process of the hike, right? Um and the, the the actual walking of the journey, the actual journey itself, each each step yeah. along that journey, and 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 if anything, by focusing on that journey, by focusing on your feet kissing the snow of that mountain side as you climb up it, that also allows you to be more present and have that attention focused away from potential negative thoughts of like it being insurmountable. Like how the fuck am I going to climb all the way to the top? You're mm -hmm. just focusing on your your feet and what's in front of you and what you're dealing with in the infinite now, and that makes it also easier to absorb the challenges as they come because you're not obsessing over all these potential pitfalls along the way. And I think that will uh, make you more successful if you're just paying attention to the now. If you're really like focused on what you're doing every single day mm. and like in it, living it, being present will help you to succeed in whatever you're doing. Um, it's certainly helping me talk to you during this podcast. <laughs> focusing on the future will ultimately like if you're constantly obsessing over it, it'll harm your present performance and limit your ability to progress towards your goal. I definitely agree with that. I just noticed something saying this is our third episode, right? And three is the magic number. As the, as the Beatles said, three is the magic number. Possibly. Something special about number three. And it's it's been three hours, man. I uh, I think we should wrap oh. this up. No, wrap it up with a nice little neat bow and uh, deliver it to someone. Someone out there will will probably watch it, maybe, right? Probably, maybe, kind of, not really. Kind Who knows? A little bit. Well, sort of, maybe, but it's okay. Even if one person watches it, maybe that's worth it, huh? It was a it was a fun conversation. Either way, I think we reached. That's a good it. excuse for us to talk. Yeah, I'm happy about that alone. I think we reached a deeper understanding, as well, yeah, of each other and uh, our. I feel closer to you already. <laughs> well, guys. Thank you so much for watching. This has uh, been a fun conversation. Doom Drop episode three. We'll see you next week for episode four. And let us know your thoughts in the comments. Let us know other ideas or topics you might want discussed. This has been uh, Shun and Saiyan. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>